Hello, dear misfits. We're almost at the end of January, and we hope we'll reach 30,000 subscribers till the end of February. Tonight we'll talk about some spine-tingling horror stories that will leave you questioning the boundaries of reality. Each video is a ticket to a deep woods where unknown cryptids and park rangers reign supreme. So, don't forget to subscribe. And now, story time. I am a park service sidewinder, and I have stories to share. This has taken me the better part of a month to work up the courage to tell the tales I have experienced. I've bounced around some, lurked here, and shared other stories from my past. But these, well they were always off limits. It wasn't that I didn't want to tell them, but rather a fear that men in white coats will suddenly take me away to a nice padded cell. Thing is, from what I know, well I'm not the only one that's had strange happenings in their time with the service. So first things first, you're probably wondering what a sidewinder is. Officially, we're members of a rather elite group of search and rescue officers who specialize in desert searches. Note that I said searches, and not rescue. Each and every one of us, collectively called sidewinders from our ability to survive in the most hostile desert conditions, are trained in everything from tracking and first aid, to survival and recovery. Typically, they only call us in on the worst cases. Someone goes missing in one of the many desert areas in the West, and after the massive search fails, we go in to recover the body, or bodies. Truth be known, we don't usually find bodies, just bones, or a few identifying items. We're also rather unique among S and R, since we tend to work alone. There's always a lot of desert to cover, and it's just more cost-effective to send in one maybe two sidewinders in to track missing persons. In my time, I've recovered something around 50 people, and only rescued one. The desert is a rather harsh place, but that kinda goes without saying. In training, they teach us that after three days in the desert, the chances of a person surviving drops exponentially. After five days, there's no hope, and it becomes a recovery. Granted, that's when you're not talking about a missing sidewinder. I remember during training, our training officer related a story about one sidewinder who had gone missing during a recovery. Almost a month later, that guy wandered into a park service office. He was skin and bones, but alive. The service had long given up on him, and his family had largely moved on. Yet here this guy was, a walking bag of bones, coming out of a hell that you can't imagine. All told, the guy had walked almost 300 miles from where he started out, to where he ended. Dude still with the service too, in case you wondered. I won't go into detail about the training, but suffice it to say that it's the hardest training you'll ever experience. 200 SNR guys sign up for the training every year, and typically only two or three actually survive the process. Most simply decide that they can't do it, though there are other reasons they drop out. The doors always seem to claim one, every training rotation. Doors. If you had told me three years ago that a simple door would be the object of terror, I would have laughed in your face. They're probably the strangest thing you'll in the high desert. Middle of nowhere, no roads or trails for miles, and there will be this door standing there upright. It's never the same kind of door either, I've seen house doors, a couple metal ones, and at least one cheap trailer door. These doors, they're creepy to say the least, but it's the fact that they move that really gets to you. I remember one recovery in particular that I was followed by one of these doors. That one started with a simple hiking incident. A couple had decided to hike out into the desert, camp overnight, and then hike back. When they didn't show at their works the next Monday, family called the park service. The S&R guys searched a good 50 mile square area of desert for them, but didn't turn anything up. So, rather reluctantly they called me in. Calling in the sidewinders was seen as admitting defeat. Even the police give us a wide berth. I packed up, 
took enough food for a two-week trip M-rays are handy in that regard, and enough water to pack in and out. With that, I hiked into the desert to follow their steps and try to retrace where they may have gone, and hopefully find this pair. Their trail was pretty easy to follow for the first few hours, before it turned off the established path and cut out across the sand pan. Their tracks showed that they were walking side by side then, and continued on for upwards of five miles like that before I found something that sent chills up my spine. The tracks suddenly turned to the left, and seemed to circle around a point up on one of the dunes. There was no reason for them to do that though, at least nothing visible. From then on, the path continued back down and headed almost directly away from that spot. The tracks continued on, before coming to a stop in the lee of a dune. They had simply evaporated. However I knew that they couldn't have gone too far, if they made the same time I had, then they likely would have reached that point about the same time I did. Thinking like the hikers, I decided that I'd be looking for shelter. A short distance away, as I picked my way through scrub and around some rocks, I came to a good camping site. Located in the shade of a large rock wall, with a nice overhang, I spread out my bed roll, and then set to getting something to eat. I think it was then that I first noticed the door. Now you need to keep in mind, by that point I'd stumbled over several of those before. This one seemed different though. It was located a short distance away, just down from where I sat. I knew well enough to steer clear of them, as they were bad news, but I have to admit I was curious. I suppose that's what prompted me to become a sidewinder in the first place, looking at things in retrospect. Curiosity. Going where no living man or woman has gone, and exploring what lay out there. The door was this large house front door, painted a bright red, so bright that it seemed to shine in the waning light. It stood there like the house it once occupied had long since fallen down, and this chunk of wood had somehow managed to stay standing. Lifting my glass of water to it, I gave a light nod, as if saying to it, yes, I know you're there. I then ate and went to sleep. I rose with the dawn, packed up and kicked out my fire before heading on further. The door was gone. No surprise there, they tended to do that. I picked up the trail shortly after, and found the remnants of a camp. From the looks of things, the couple had camped there for a day before leaving. Suddenly, everything was torn, there were signs of a struggle, or more likely a fight. Two sets of tracks headed off into the desert from there, each going a different direction. I surmised that they must have had an argument over something, and had wandered off to cool their heads. Problem was, I couldn't see any indication that they had returned. So that meant that they'd split up, which is bad to do in the first place, and then something had happened. Most common killing cause out here is someone slipping into a crack in the ground, and just never getting out. Kinda like the guy down in Moab, but with no survival. I decided that I'd check the leftmost path first, as that one seemed to head down into the sand. The other went up over some rocks and headed down into a valley area, but tracking that would be a royal pain in the ass, and honestly I was here to tag and recover bodies. Whatever makes that job easier, is what wins. I followed that sandy trail a good 300 feet before it simply stopped. Not petered out, as often happens, not turned back on itself, no, it just stopped. Mid-step no less, turning around and checking my maps, I made note of this for an aerial search before turning around to walk back. Behind me, not three feet from the trail, and maybe twenty from where I stood, was that same red door. I stopped in my tracks there, pausing for a long time. Chills ran up my spine, and I broke out in a cold sweat. I probably stood there a good 10 minutes before I mustered up the courage to walk back the way I had came. I didn't even shoot a glance at the door then, opting to ignore it from that point forward. Leaving it in my wake, I continued on to follow the second track. That one continued deeper in the desert, and seemed to be heading in a particular direction. 
as if the person leaving it had known where they were going. Sadly nothing lay in that direction, at least not for a good hundred miles of hard scrub. Well let me rephrase that, nothing worth finding. There was that damn door, I'd see it every now and then, usually off the trail a short distance, sometimes even hidden up at the top of a bluff, that there was no way for it to be put up there in the first place. Always following me, always beckoning me closer. In the end, after a good week out on the search, I called it quits. I hiked back out, providing the S and R guys with the evidence I had found, and suggesting that they just write it off. The desert had claimed two more, or maybe the doors had. It would be a good year and a half further on before there would be some closure to that story. While on a fire patrol outside Vegas, a park ranger saw smoke rising off in the distance. Driving that way, he eventually came to the source of the smoke. It was the remnants of a small brush fire that was quickly burning itself out. He was, reportedly, about ready to chalk it up to lightning, when he tripped over the bodies. The strange thing, he would later tell the authorities, is that the two looked like they just appeared from nowhere. Trails leading to where they lay were quickly found, but those trails just appeared out of thin air. An autopsy was performed, and it was discovered that they had died from exposure. They were identified by family as being the pair who I had been sent in after. Though mysteries remained. For example, how had they, with no food or water, crossed a full 500 miles of open desert? Why were their clothes untouched by the weather, and strangest of all, how had they managed to keep their cellular phones at a full charge? With nothing to charge them with. I have many other stories to tell such as a town you won't find on any map, or the many ghosts that wander the sands, or the sheer number of planes that simply vanish in this area. When I have some time, I'll post those. Born and raised in Australia, I had been a ranger in the Northern Territory for almost two years. The job of a park ranger here is very different from what people out there might think. We're not worrying and talking about the same little cute red-coated individual who keeps an eye out for litter bugs, or makes sure that people don't leave their garbage behind. We actually get off our butts and go into the woods, making sure nobody gets lost, hurt, or eaten by any of the dangerous animals indigenous to this area of the world. I've seen my fair share of Australian wildlife on the job, so I know from experience when something is not right about an animal encounter. It was a very hot summer night back in 2004, while patrolling the Kakadu National Park that I first encountered the Bruin Drawer. For those who are out of the loop, this is what it looked like. I had just finished patrolling around one particular area, and was getting ready to head back to my car so I could drive to the next one. I heard a noise in the distance. At first, it started off as just little bits of noise, but the sound grew tremendously, so I finally took a look over my shoulder, and saw this a huge bipedal animal about 20 feet in length, slowly walking through the brush with its high set tail swinging back and forth like a metronome. It had small nubby claws on its front legs, and its front quarters were covered in dark red feathers merging down into black downy ones toward the end of its body. I thought to myself, dear God, what am I looking at? This animal looked like a living dinosaur from all the cryptozoology books I've ever read. The sighting did not last long, however, it quickly moved past me, and its tail was the last thing I saw going off into the bush. It left me in a state of shock for a long time after. I then did some research online to see if anybody else had reported seeing anything similar. Only a few other stories have resurfaced about a similar animal being spotted by others here in Australia. Additionally, earlier Aboriginal accounts suggest that it is a reptilian animal of some kind, although I'm not exactly sure what it is. It looked prehistoric, that's for sure. I'm a park ranger or guide in Greater Kruger area. 
A while ago I was guiding student groups on a farm in Bowel Reserve. We stayed in an old farmhouse, some rooms were turned into dorm rooms. One day a staff member went to fetch some sand from a dry riverbed nearby he needed to make some cement. He came back saying he saw, tracks of an animal that he'd never seen. He had some of his colleagues have a look. They all said the same thing. So by now I'm intrigued and I go down to the riverbed to have a look. Sure enough, there they are. Like a buffalo, but not exactly the round shape you'd expect. Seemed like two pairs of buffalo tracks. Then I saw it, that's not two pairs, it's four pairs, of an animal walking upright, goosebumps all over, hair on my neck standing straight up. I called the warden. He came with his new sniffer dog. That dog went to work, but it was obvious those strange animals knew we were on them. Out the reserve, over the railway line, back in the reserve, then again onto another farm, all the way to the horse stables at the edge of Hodesbrook town. That s where we caught the last one, hiding in the stables. But there were four in total. The one we got first broke a leg when jumping over the fence of the reserve. Two others try to hide under the railway line. Later we also found the rifle, which they had thrown away while running, A308 with a silencer. We also found bullets and a panga. Now we could charge them with something else than trespassing. They didn't make a victim, that time. But they are successful regularly. All our anti-poaching efforts are like mopping with a running tap. I think our rhino are on the way out. We try to fight the symptoms, but cannot fight the cause. And no one seems to care on the whole planet. For just a few species lion, rhino, elephant, pangolin no one puts political pressure on any country in the Far East. My grandfather used to tell stories about doors, but not really doors, in the sense of a plank of wood that fills in a doorway. More like artificial, but not artificial arch or doorways. So, a bit of backstory, my grandfather identified as Lip and Apache. I don't know if this is just family oral tradition or tribal lore. But him and my grandmother, not native, Mexican-American used to live outside way outside technically on the outskirts of a small town on the outskirts of McAllen, Texas. Their property was on the biggest hill in the middle of an old very old garbage dump. El Monte had already reclaimed it by the time I came along. The property had one tiny trailer home, no running water, a bath shed, and an outhouse. Growing up, my cousins and I had the option of exploring the wild area of the property. It was a desert Y area, but more of a really dry grassland with more cactus than is really necessary. My grandfather used to warn us to stay away from doorways. Being like six, he knew he had to break it down for me, and my other younger cousins. So he broke it down as, if you see a branch leaning against a tree, that's a doorway, don't pass through it. If you see two branches standing but leaning against each other like this shape, don't pass under them, that's a doorway. I can't say that we easily let it go, but our Eula was never afraid of anything, yet bringing up the doorways made him visibly uneasy. So we explored and found tarantulas, rattlers, some jackrabbit, a roadrunner, a deer and her fawn. Thankfully, no doorways. I didn't bring it up again until my Eula was dying of lung cancer, tobacco is medicine. Yes, Eula fine. But there's more than just tobacco in USA Gold Red 100s. But I asked about the doorways. He said that his father had told him about them, and his father had been educated by his grandmother my grandfather's great-grandmother, who was a medicine woman he called her Akura. He told me then that they were traps set up by wicked spirits to trick humans into entering the spirit realm, their other motivations unknown. He told me his father told him tales about children passing under these artificial archways, but not coming out the other side, and never being seen again. Honestly, that's what this post made me think of. But the spirits have changed it up, to be recognizable by the white man's mind, 
That's why I think it's not the same as he used to describe it, but it is the same forces. Maybe Yulo should have told us to avoid doors too. When I was a teen back in the early 2000s I had a great fascination with werewolves. My uncle told me of this time when he and a friend were driving around Arlington, Ohio and a creature had walked in the middle of the road that looked like a big dog, and the back reached the hood of the car, but was longer and had more mass than any dog they had ever seen. He said then it leaped to the side of the road, and they drove off quickly. Now I at first called him a liar and said it was BS, but I went down to Florida two years ago and stayed with a cousin whose dad is one of my uncle's best friends. One night I was talking to him and I said, did my uncle ever tell you of the time that he and some friends were driving around Arlington? This is where he interrupted me instantly and said a werewolf jumped out in front of the car. Now my uncle had not talked to this person for over five years, and I had not mentioned anything about this to him before asking him. I was later told, by my dad's girlfriend who grew up around Arlington on a farm, that something happened to her when she was 10 years old. She said that her family were all eating supper one night, and they remembered that they had forgotten to feed the chickens that day. So they had to run out and do it after supper. Her dad told her and her younger brother to go out and feed them. They got out into the shed that the chickens were in and heard scratching and clawing at the side of the shed. They both froze on the spot, not moving a muscle. Her dad then walked to the back porch and turned the light on, and he yelled out to them. When I tell you to run, I want you to hold on to your brother and run for this door. Don't stop until you get to me. So they ran as fast as they could when her dad told them to run. When she reached the safety of the house, she asked him why he told them to run. He refused to tell her. So one day, when she was 16, her father told her what had happened. He had seen a shadow of something that reminded him of a bear on the barn by the shed. He said it was tall and slender and unlike any bear he had ever seen. That is all he told her. This happened in West Virginia about 10 years ago. I have done my best to stuff my memory of it deep down, but I accidentally watched a video on YouTube that basically re-traumatized me. What the presenter said really freaked me out and brought up this memory, and now I don't know WTF to do with it. She discussed Dear Gods and Interdimensional Being Encounters. When I was 22 I went out hunting with my dad and uncle. We each had our own deer stand and blind in the private hunting ground that my uncle owned. About halfway through the morning hunt, there was this big buck that strode into my view, but he didn't look quite right. Not in a sick or mentally ill way. His eyes were more human-like. The eyes looked like they contained a lot more intelligence. I put my gun to my eye to aim and the buck stopped cold. I swear he was looking at me. He knew. Then when I took the shot, my trusty gun would not fire. In a scramble, I checked my gun. It was fine. But it wouldn't shoot. The deer just stood there and kept staring at me. Then, on my second check of the gun, I got a really weird and eerie feeling. When I looked back up, this thing was standing on its hind legs and staring at me. I froze. It started to charge running on its hind legs, full speed, directly toward my stand. I left everything and fell about halfway down the ladder. I know I screwed up my ankle that day, and I didn't care. I was terrified. I could hear the footsteps running towards me, and I ran as fast as I could. Maybe like a fourth of the way to my dad's blind, I looked behind me because I was still hearing the footsteps right on my heels. But there was nothing there. The running steps chased me almost until I got to the blind. My dad thought I had been shot or something because of how I was behaving and breathing. He carried me to the truck, and when I calmed down he told me that he'd heard other similar stories in the area. I haven't gone into the woods or hunting since. 
That was 10 years ago, and until now, I haven't known WTF to do with my experience. I've been kind of watching and listening to paranormal shows since then, trying to make sense of it. Just last week, I watched that video on YouTube about deer, and their relation to death, gods, Fordian theories, and the like. Since watching that episode, I've been messed up thinking that I was trying to kill a deer god, and that's why the buck chased me. She had some great points, and a really interesting interdimensional theory. It might have put some pieces together for me. But should I go back to those woods and apologize? I'm paralyzed in fear to this day about it all, and I'm not trying to make enemies, especially with some wild god. What should I do? I live in the greater Baltimore area of Maryland, in a wooded area of Catonsville. I have experienced multiple phenomena that I cannot explain. These things I can only describe as cryptids. The creature that I saw was large and had wings. It was very late on a summer night, and I was 20 or so. I had just gotten into an argument with my girlfriend, and was sitting on my porch smoking a cigarette. In front of my porch was my short driveway that led to the street. This is a newer neighborhood and fairly well lit. I saw what can only be described as the silhouette of a large winged creature. The wingspan was at least six feet wide if not more. No torso, no wings in the true sense. It was almost like a shadow of a large crane skeleton. I know that doesn't make sense, but that is how it appeared to me. The wings were but a thin projection like the bones of a bird's wings. There was no skin flap like in bats or feathers like a bird. The rest of the body was similar, more like the suggestion of a body in this shadow form. The way it moved was truly terrifying to me. There was an otherworldliness to how it moved. I am an avid outdoorsman. I have seen cranes, geese, swans, hawks, etc. Hundreds of times during hikes and camping trips. I have never seen an animal move in this way. It glided with a grace, a timelessness even, that I don't think a physical animal could manage. I was horrified. I ran down my driveway it had flown directly overhead towards the street, but I did not see it again. I called my girlfriend crying. I was absolutely terrified. Hello, I have a few short experiences to tell you about. This all started when I was about 12 years old, and I am 19 now. My sister Zoe, father, stepmother at the time, and her two daughters, Jade who was my age and Maddie who's my sister's age, were camping. We had only been there for a day, and everything was fine. Then, my sisters and I decided to go to the stream by ourselves. My father gave us a walkie-talkie just so we could keep in contact while we were gone. The place we were going to was surrounded by bush, and to get there, you had to go down a little path through it. We spent a while with our shoes off, splashing in the water when Jade said she could see something standing amongst the trees. We all looked and saw a figure. It was black, but you could tell it was the shape of a man, and you couldn't see the face. We stared for a few seconds, and then it disappeared. We forgot about it and kept playing in the water, but I felt a little uneasy. A while later, we all looked back wanting to know if it was still there, and it was. Everything was silent, I could hardly hear the rapids in the little stream. We stopped looking after about 20 minutes, and we headed back to the campsite. The forest and all the noise around us were dead silent. My sisters lingered behind, and I was about 20 meters ahead of them, but we couldn't see each other. I heard a twig snap behind me, and I turned to look, assuming that they had caught up to me. No, I turned to see the tall, dark black figure literally a foot behind me. So, I started running, the whole time feeling it close behind me. I ran as fast as I could until I was out in the open campground, and it was gone. My sisters came out not long after I did, and I told them what had happened. I asked, but none of them had seen it behind me, 
and they were too far behind anyway since the path was windy, so they were around a corner from me most of the time. Throughout our camping trip, we didn't see it around as much, but occasionally, we would just see this figure standing there, watching us. Fast forward a couple of years, and we went back there with my father's new girlfriend and her daughter Stella. I can't quite recall this trip as much, but I know for a fact that Stella saw it too. My husband, Kit, and I live out in the middle of nowhere on a plot of land that's about 100 acres. I'd say probably 95 of those acres are wilderness with a TV and hiking trails that we, and several of the previous owners, created by exploring. We use that land for camping, hiking and hunting. We like to find a spot, clear it a bit, and camp overnight. There's so much space we've never stayed in the same place twice. We've seen some kill sites, both old and fresh. Lots of animal tracks, places where deer bed down etc. I've even spent a lot of time hiking solo, while the kid is in school and husband's at work. Whether alone or with the family, we always carry a firearm for protection. A few weeks ago, we decided to load up our camping gear and start a new trail. We mark the trails we make with spray paint on trees. We were pretty far in the woods, having hiked almost an hour when the atmosphere seemed to change. I don't know who noticed it first, but my husband, who was leading the three of us, turned around and gave me a concerned look. The birds had stopped chirping, the insects were quiet. There were no sounds around us. When in the woods, complete quietness is rarely a good thing. We continued onward, hyper aware of our surrounds while our kid continued merrily talking. We came to the stream that marks the midway point of our property. We stopped for a few minutes, my husband and I in a stare down with each other. We both felt something was off, but didn't want to scare our daughter. I finally broke the silence and said I suddenly didn't feel good, and that we should go home. My husband nodded in agreement while our daughter voiced her protest. Too bad kiddo. We turned around and started back. After going a few hundred yards, still in silent wilderness, I looked to my right and saw a person crouched down in a gill suit about 150 feet off our trail. I'm positive they saw that I noticed them, but they never moved. I cleared my throat to get my husband's attention, and when he looked back, I put my hand on the gun and the holster on my hip, which caused him to readjust his rifle in preparation of anything. I sped up my family and we hurried back home. I told my husband as soon as we were inside. We decided to call the police and report the trespasser. Filed a report and was told to call again if we saw anyone. A few days later, my husband and I went out alone and set up a bunch of deer cams. We didn't go back out into the woods for maybe a week, then he and I ventured out to retrieve the cam footage. Out of the nine cams we placed, we caught a person in a ghillie suit in two images. We handed copies over to the cops to go with our report. We haven't gone back out since except to check the deer cams. Haven't gotten any other trespassers. It freaks me out even more to think of the few times, while camping that we heard walking near our tent in the middle of the night. We always assumed it was curious animals, but now I'm not so sure. Hiking way off trail in the Tetons, stopped for a breather, and then heard the sounds of something big. Walking through the fallen leaves, crash crash, like, clearly footfalls, sounded like something heavy, elk or grizzly size. I could hear branches snapping when it stepped on fallen branches. But the thing was, I couldn't see it. There was nothing moving anywhere around me, and I had a pretty good line of sight all around. I just sat very still looking all around while it went crash crash, until finally it walked away. It was totally like there was an invisible, but very audible, lol ghost walking around me. All I could think afterwards was that maybe there was a little gully close by that I hadn't seen, 
and it was walking in the gully. There were a lot of fallen trees, and though it looked like mostly level ground, the Tetons generally do have gullies and depressions. Maybe a couple of tree logs were hiding a gully, I don't know. I still tell people about the invisible elk that I met, lol. I was 13 years of age approximately, sometime during 2003. I was in my home and had fallen asleep in my bedroom on a night before attending school at Sophia Academy off of Mount Vernon Highway in Sandy Springs, Georgia during 6th grade. I woke up when my alarm went off as usual, and began to get into the shower as normal. I was pensive in thought, and had a hard time remembering my sleep as I was entering the shower. I stepped in and started showering and noticed a rough feeling underneath my left foot as I was washing my feet. I noticed a symmetrical pattern of dot-shaped puncture marks and a perfect circle similar to a picture I noticed online. At that moment, I instantly had flashbacks of what just occurred to me while I was asleep. At that point, I realized everything that happened to me included a violation of my personal space, and a seemingly near-death experience. The marking under my foot was an indicator a sample of my blood may have been taken by these beings when I was awoken. There was a sharp stinging sensation right under my foot that woke me up. My vision was very blurry initially as I began to open my eyes and sit up to feel what it was that hurt my foot. As I was opening my eyes, I sat up on what appeared to be a large aluminum table to four large grey reptilian beings seven nine feet tall standing by the edge of the table by my feet. As I sat up, I noticed all of their eyes began to open wider, and their mouths began to open up and let out a horrifying sound. There was an extremely high-pitched shrieking sound, and they threw their hands up in the air, and were flailing backwards away from me as if they were going to fall over. I then got extremely tired and couldn't sit up very well so laid back down on the table to turn my head to the left. I remember just turning my head and praying to God saying God help me, Lord Jesus help me because I was terrified and didn't want those beings any closer to me, and was afraid of getting devoured and or ripped apart. I just turned my head as I lay down and prayed to God to protect me, and ask him to ransom me from this stressful situation. As I lay back down, I do not recall ever getting back up or waking back up until I found my alarm going off and started getting ready for school. It was right after I woke up and I was in the shower that I noticed what had happened to me. My first job was for a local national forest. I would go out and clean trails, mow, paint buildings, outdoorsy stuff. We had several campsites that we had to check and make sure the trash was cleared, the bathrooms were clean and people weren't making drugs. We had one park that had a reputation as a meeting area for gay men small town Ohio in the 90s early 2000s. Well, one day we have to go and check out the site, and it was my turn for trash duty. I get out, take one bag to the truck and go to check the picnic area, and I see two men having sex. My 15-year-old brain exploded. They took off running and so did I. I just noped right out of there and told my co-workers the trash was empty. I wasn't hiking but I was biking. My friends and I were walking our bikes through a forest area. We were trying to get to another neighborhood that we knew of, and there was a shortcut through that particular forest. All of a sudden we heard the most horrifying low scream. I've heard foxes scream before, but this just sounded too low to be one. It sounded like a man that was just completely insane. The first time I ever went camping with my kids, it was at a Girl Scout camp in southern Michigan about five years ago. We the Cub Scout troop were all camped in this flat clearing, on top of a hill overlooking the lake. 
To get to the bathrooms you had to walk down this big hill through the forest, and up another hill. I woke up at about 3-4 am, and had to pee really bad. I wasn't comfortable enough with the group yet to just go close-ish to the tent, so I decided to walk to the bathrooms. I was already nervous about the whole thing, but I was going to, be a grown-up and just do it. About halfway there where the hill started going back up, I started feeling like something, not right, was nearby. And then suddenly I heard a noise off to the right of me that I still have no explanation for. It was like a loud, predatorial screech or scream, like something was hunting and about to make a kill. I took about a one second pause, was like, nope, not today, and speed walked my way back to the tent. I woke my boy's dad up and asked if he'd heard it, but he didn't and just acted annoyed with me for waking him up. I felt insane and like I'd just been making it up until the next morning when another mom asked us, did anyone else hear that loud noise in the woods last night at about 3 am? I've lived in Michigan most of my life. This wasn't any of the normal scary, wood screaming noises like a bobcat, owl, fox, opossum etc. that we have here. The other mom was also someone that was big into the outdoors and camping, and she confirmed that this didn't sound like anything she'd ever heard of before either. There's probably a logical explanation for it, but whatever it was didn't feel right, and I've seen enough horror movies to know that I was holding that pee for the rest of the night lol. In the early 70s my father owned a 42-foot yacht for business. He would wine and dine business guests on Lake Michigan. Us kids were his crewmates and would tend to everything whenever VIP guests were on board. My earliest childhood memory is when we had the people from McDonald's on board. We were a few miles out and and father told my brother and I to pick up anchor and I remember the bloated body we hauled up caught on the anchor cable. I remember all the adults discussing what to do and consensus was to cut the cable and act like nothing happened. It was Chicago in the 70s best not get involved. I was at Boy Scout camp when younger. The land the camp is on is former Native American grounds. We were hiking and came across an Indian burial ground. I was very young and my friends and I had no clue what we had stumbled upon because, one, there was no uniformity to the placement of grave markers like a standard cemetery too. It was the literal middle of the woods surrounded by trees, and not near anything for over a mile. 3. The markers looked like old box TVS the kinds from the 80s and 90s. They didn't register as grave markers for a while to our brains. As I said my friends and I were young and dumb 12 or 13 and several of my friends played on them such as jumping from on top of one to another. I think another guy stopped to pee on one. After a few minutes a weird feeling hit all of us that were there at once. It was like we had become overcome with dread, fear and fright. It was like someone whispered into our brains to make us understand without words where we were and what we were doing all at once. We all looked at each other and ran through the woods back the way we came. It's probably just paranoia, but I felt like something followed us back through the woods that day to make sure we were gone. I was out hiking in the woods when I was a teenager, and I stumbled across a single gravestone surrounded by a white picket fence. Apparently, it was a memorial to a coal miner who was lost in a mine collapse. The man and two others were trapped after the mine collapsed after several days, rescuers managed to get provisions to the two via a borehole, which kept them alive down there for two weeks, until they could be rescued by pulling them up through a tiny hole using a harness. The two survivors swore that the third man was not in the same area as they were when it collapsed, but rumors of them having cannibalized the third man followed them for the rest of their lives. If you are interested in reading more, 
Look up the Shepton Mine Disaster. My aunt and sister and dad were visiting, and we were exploring at a nearby area. Not a secluded area, but had large areas of forest. It was at the edge of town and only a few abandoned buildings or sheds around. We saw old stone stairs just leading into the woods. They were really cool looking so we were taking pictures on them. Then went farther up on them because we were curious where they went and what they were. They finally just ended all crumbled, but there was a clearing. There was one of those white crosses with old flowers and gifts decorating it like the ones people put on the side of the road when someone dies in an accident. There was a girl's name carved into it. My aunt in her 60s at the time, a grounded person not a paranormal buff or anything kept saying, something terrible happened here, it is so awful. The rest of us guessed it must have been an accident from hiking or something. My aunt was really sad and kept saying how horrible she felt. When we got home I looked up the name on the internet, and it was a girl who was pregnant that was lured there by her boyfriend and viscously murdered. The article had said one of the most gruesome murders in the state. My aunt just said, I knew something terrible happened there, I could just feel it. When my sister looked back at the pictures we took on the stairs, there were multiple pictures with big orbs floating in them. My sister has a nice camera and takes pictures as a hobby so has taken many pictures with her camera and never had orbs before. None in any of the pictures before the stairs or any of the other days we were out taking pictures. They were very clearly there anywhere from golf ball size to cantaloupe size with clearly defined edges. They were like a milky white or gray color. It was daytime when they were taken. Lived in Southeast Michigan until I was 17. I frequently stayed with an aunt, who lived a few blocks away from a filthy river beneath some old train tracks. All of the local kids hung out there occasionally, but mainly pre-teens or early high school kids to do drugs, hook up, or practice shitty graffiti. There were also homeless people on occasion, but it became less common with so many kids using the area for themselves. Kids reported cars following them to the area, or sitting in a nearby parking lot and watching them, but I had never heard of any sort of altercations or attempted kidnappings. Just downriver creeps. Late middle school or early high school, I would visit the river or tracks with friends. It is wooded, but lightly. The woods are filled with steep hills, so generally people did not venture into them. You could cut through the woods to get onto the train tracks or bridge, but it was a pain in the ass or most people opted to walk to the tracks via the street. Anyway, I was with two friends, trudging through the woods so that we could hang out on the tracks or bridge, rather than by the water. I noticed a black plastic bag hanging from a branch on a tree. It had been tied closed. We just couldn't help ourselves and wanted to know what could be inside. We took two sticks to remove the bag from the tree. It was very light. We used the sticks to tear a hole in the bag, then stretched or pulled it open. We found a pair of boys or youth underwear they were a plain gray or black, but too small to be men's covered in a dry, rust-colored substance. Whatever it was, we assumed blood, was all over the underwear. I don't remember any scent, but I recall how the underwear seemed so stiff from the blood. We were able to remove the underwear from the bag, and also found a small pocket knife, which also had the same substance on it, but was mostly clean. It freaked the three of us out, of course. We were so spooked by this that we immediately decided it was time to leave once we fully processed what we were seeing. We left the bag, underwear, and knife on the ground in the woods and went home. I was walking in a desolate wooded area near a friend's farm, looked up and saw a guy in full camp leaning against tree with a rifle. He was fully absorbed visually by the tree. 
He could have easily killed me, and no one would have found me for days except the coyotes. Stills creeps me out. On a pretty isolated island in a man-made lake in Georgia, about a mile long and roughly 200-300 feet wide, and completely covered in woods, I was walking around exploring when I fell into a hole in the earth that was completely invisible to the naked eye beneath layers of dry leaves. It had obviously been concealed for many years. It was 2004 when I literally stumbled into this, and it looked like it had been hidden beneath seasons of dead leaves and dirt for over a decade. I grew up across the shore and knew that no one ever really visited this island, except for the multitude of wildlife that inhabited it. The hole was perfectly square in shape, about 4 feet by 4 feet, only about 6-7 feet deep, and empty except for a few pieces of trash inside of it mostly old glass soda bottles, beer bottles etc. That looked like they were from the 1970s. The dirt walls looked as if they had been packed purposefully. I'm only 5 foot 1, so I had some trouble climbing out. The WTF adrenaline panic rush, I got helped me a bit. I think there may have been a couple of cinder blocks in there, that someone probably used as a stepping block. A rotted wooden plank door that was just pulled over the hole covered it, and that's what I fell through. It looked like some kind of makeshift bunker. It could have been dug there by a deer hunter. The island had a decent white-tailed deer population. Maybe a bored kid did it. Who knows? But it is the creepiest thing I've ever found in the woods. Bought two kids' bed frames off Craigslist. They were simple, IKEA frames. The guy was a middle-aged dad. Seemed really nice. Also offered some wall art, and said that his kids had just grown out of it, onto other things. A week later my 8-year-old daughter has a sore on her hand. We had no idea what it was. She started getting more sores, and we thought it was allergies. Put her through the ringer in terms of allergy testing etc. Really difficult for her. Sores get worse. Nothing is helping. We find bed bugs in the frame of the bed. They had infested her room. Guy sold us bed bug infested bed frames. Also threw in bed bug infested wall art for good measure. Thanks. A couple of months ago I put my car up for sale as I was moving away for university, and I couldn't afford it. Some guy contacts me asking if I can meet him at the local retail park. We agree a time and a place. I turn up, and he's already there just stood in the middle of the parking lot. My initial thoughts were that this guy was a bit weird, but hey, I need the money. I start showing him around the car when he stops me and says, it's fine, don't worry. This took me back a bit, but whatever. He then agrees on the price without negotiating at all, which I was pretty happy with. He starts telling me how he's buying it for his daughter or some shit. But surely you'd want to make sure the car was in decent condition, if you were buying someone a car. So I take the money and count it up, and it's all there. Then it gets even more strange. I get the paperwork out to sign the car over to him, and the guy tells me to fill in his details for him. So obviously this is pretty odd, so I ask him his name, and how it's spelt. To which he pulls a credit card out of his pocket, and says, that's me. I take the money straight to the bank on the retail park, and put it in my account, and it was fine. All real money, no fake bills. Here's the really weird part. I drove past the retail park about a month afterwards, and the car's still there. In the exact spot I parked it in. I was selling my Suzuki V-Strom DL1000 for $6500 S. It was low mileage, and I had a couple grand and accessories on it, so that was a smoking deal. 
Within an hour of posting the ad, I get the usual scam emails, I'll pay you 8k certified funds, deposit it, and send the balance to my shipper etc. Then I get an email from a guy about an hour away. He calls me and asks if I'll take 3 grand. Nope. Day later. How about 4? F right off, thanks. Still later. Okay, he says, I'll go no higher than $5,000 S, still no. Couple days later I get a serious buyer who pays the full price, shows up with cash, we do the deal, both happy. So now the bike is sold, title signed over, and the first guy shows up at my house. Keep in mind, I lived in a small, rural NH town, and I have no idea how he found me. He just pulled into my property, I see his car coming up the 75 yard driveway, so I put my CCW under my shirt, and go out on the porch. He says, I'm Jimmy. We spoke the other day, and I'm here to pick up the Suzuki, I've got cash. I tell him it's sold, and he goes bananas. We had a deal, no, we did not so please leave. I walked back into my house and locked the door. But he stood there for 10 minutes screaming, until I yelled through the window that I was calling the cops. People are weird. I was selling my truck, and this guy maybe about 40 came by with his daughter like 15 and his buddy. I'm using my friendly banter to try and smooth out the deal. Dude decides to buy, and as he is counting out the cash, I'm chatting with the buddy and the daughter. Out of nowhere the buyer says, You sick bastard you don't think I see what you are doing. I thought he was joking so I say, Ooh you caught me. I knew it. You have been hitting on my daughter this whole time you sick f. I should call the police on your pedophile ass. Absolutely shouting this in my driveway. Daddy no he is just being friendly. Oh you defending your new boyfriend, give me your phone, I bet his number is in there. Just batch it crazy, screaming in my driveway about how I was trying to F this high school girl, and how I'm a pervert. Literally nothing caused it. Dude stormed off to his buddy's car without completing the transaction. The buddy just looked at me slack jawed, and we exchanged this, holy shit did that just happen, look before he left. Worst part was I had neighbors outside who heard or saw the whole thing. Sold my couch on Craigslist. Nice dark leather couch in great shape, it was just taking up too much space in my place. Anyways a guy offers me 250 for it, and I agreed. I get to his house with the couch, and it's a nice house, I'm talking 1-2 million is my guesstimate in around a city where you can get a very decent 3 bed 2 bath home for 170k. I pull up and the guy walks out, big huge black guy ripped to the tits. He pays me 300 cash which I thanked him for. We carry it into his sort of garage looking thing, except it these automated glass door things on them that were open. He offers me a drink and points to this full side-by-side -side open glass cooler, that's 6 feet tall full of maybe 50 different kinds of beers, lots of wines, a bunch of liquor etc. I'd normally say no, but he has rogue dead guy ale $3 beer at a discount alcohol retailer, and I really like it so I take one, and he has a lot of cool shit. We start bullshitting about sports and video games, Straight up says, hey, can I suck your D? Caught me really off guard. Keep in mind this guy is huge, like I'm not just worried about him messing me, I'm worried about him using me as a condom to F something bigger than me. I'm just like, nah I'm okay, I gotta get going. Come on man, let me suck that D. I'll make it an even 500 hundred for the couch. He sucked me off, paid me then asked me to leave. I was looking for a tow dolly to pull behind a work truck, and found a reasonable deal on CL. The lady says, I won't be there, but my sister will be, 
You can go tomorrow afternoon. I drive an hour up to Bum F. Wisconsin, meet the sister, approve of the tow dolly, and get my business checkbook out. Cash only. I'm sorry ma'am, your sister said nothing about that. I don't have cash with me. This is a business check, and I'd be happy to call my bank with you right now so you can verify funds. Cash only, go into town and go to the bank. Ma'am, the bank in town isn't my bank, they won't cash my check. Cash only, I don't know what scam you're pulling. Have you ever even used Craigslist? Do you think you could get your sister on the line? Pay up or GTFO. As I walked back to my truck shaking my head, I muttered, unbelievable. What the F did you say to me? So I drive into town, where a buddy lives and tell him the story. The seller calls me, apologizes profusely, and asks if I can wait two hours till she can get there. I acquiesce. I get there, and the seller takes me back to hook the dolly up and take payment, when a redneck ex-biker with a mullet materializes with a gun demanding to know what the F I said to his wife earlier. I hightailed the F out of there very quickly. The seller was yelling her apologies as I drove away. I made note of their confederate flag as I pulled out the driveway and reassessed my Craigslist purchasing habits. Put a TV up on Craigslist. It was a big sucker, so I was asking $600 as for it way more than it was worth. But whatever, people make offers. I get a guy who says he'll pay the full $600 s. Kick ass, I think. He then mentions that he will need it delivered, which I specifically mention in the ad will not happen. We argue back and forth for a while, then he seems to relent. We discuss features for a few more minutes, then he drops this line. When you drop it off, please bring $400 in cash. I only have a $1,000 bill. I was just stunned. When I looked up the address, it was in a really shady part of town, although I don't think anyone reading this will need that detail to figure out the game here. I just told him not to call again and hung up. He tried calling from different numbers with the same proposal making up voices. Then he tried getting I presume his girlfriend to call. With the exact same deal. Maybe he was trolling. Or maybe he actually thought it would work. I would have rather just smashed it. Not one horrible event, but a series of unfortunate events. I was living in a house with two other roommates. One roommate worked afternoon through night and wasn't around during the evenings, and the other had just gotten a dream job in another city and moved out. After he moved, he asked me to help with showing the place to potential sub-tenants from Craigslist, since he still had six plus months still on the lease. He would usually just text me with the info about the person to make sure I was okay with them, basically trying to screen out anyone who seemed creepy, since I'm a female and arrange a time for me to be at the house to meet them. For months, I would have one to three days a week, where I would have to either leave work a little early or forego an evening activity to show the house. The problem? About 80% of the time, they wouldn't show up. I probably spent a total of 75 hours waiting on my couch for people that scheduled a time to stop by and never did. Nor did they respond to any further emails or texts. It made me realize how crappy people can be, to just not give a rat's ass about wasting another person's time, or having the common courtesy to say, sorry I can't make it. Posted my car for sale on Craigslist. Got a call, decides he isn't interested, whatever no big deal. 2 AM I get a call from the same dude, and for some stupid reason I answer. He's just saying, I'm so sorry over and over and when I'm like, what? I realize he's jerking the gherkin on the phone. Hung up. 
called me three more times after that until I finally changed my number. Sold a game to a guy on Craigslist once, he was super nice. We met in a parking lot of a Toys R Us at around 9 p.m., plenty of cars around still, cameras etc. I felt safe. After he gave me cash, he said, by the way, if you ever want to hang out or play games or anything, hit me up. Just. You should know that I have a record. Me. Um, what? Him. Yeah, just look up the name X and Spokane, Washington. You'll see what I mean. I honestly can't remember the guy's name, this was 6 plus years ago. I went home that night and looked him up. Sure enough. The guy had been arrested by the FBI at like 16 years old for being part of a two-man money scheme involving ISPS and overseas investments or something. And he and the other guy who was his partner overseas had swindled something like $50 million out of thousands of people. Needless to say, I did not text him back after that. late to the party, but I'll give my near-death experience with Craigslist here anyways. Back in high school I was selling some stuff on Craigslist. This guy hits me up looking to buy, and the date he wanted to meet up didn't work with my work schedule, so I told him I could later that week. Fast forward a couple of days I get off work, and as soon as I'm off work I get a call from a blocked number, which typically means police enforcement in my mind. I answer, and they say, Hi. This is the Kansas City Police Department, and we noticed you had communication with X, I don't remember his name. What is your relationship to him, and how do you know him? I answered saying, I don't know X, but I do believe that might have been a guy I was trying to do a Craigslist deal with. They respond saying, Thank you, that is all. At the time it didn't really hit me, but after work I went over to a friend's house for dinner. As I walk in my friend's mom is watching the news, and she exclaims, Did you hear what happened? They found a girl murdered. Believe by a river. Minutes later on the screen the news report states, The police have found the primary suspect of the murder to be the male ex, and is currently in police custody. Not long later the man was found guilty. I literally could have been that poor girl, but I am really thankful to this day that it wasn't me. Really scary stuff. I was selling a fairly new couch and got a few offers, but one guy texted me and said he could pick it up in an hour, so I decided to go with him. He shows up, and he looks like a gangbanger parody in that his gangbanger look is so over the top you wonder if it could be real. Jeans sagging to his knees, white wife beater. Thug life tattooed in giant letters on his neck, chains, a grill, everything. He talks like a gangbanger from a movie, does that thing where he reaches for his nose after every three seconds, he has all the mannerisms. So I let him in, show him the couch, and his girlfriend comes in a few seconds later. She basically looks like the female equivalent of his over-the-top look. I'm sitting there showing them the couch, thinking how weird the situation is, when they start to have the most adorably mushy, new couple s discussion about where the couch will go in their apartment, how it will mesh with their plants, and how he's really excited to put the coffee table in front of it, how they will have to keep the dog off it etc. They paid me, I helped them load it onto his car, and they thanked me profusely and drove away. That's it. No horror story. They were awesome people, and I learned a good lesson about not judging people on how they looked. Story time. My father was driving a truck and at around 3 a.m. in California, he was on a dirt road in between corn fields, going faster than he should have been probably. When all of a sudden, some woman appeared on the side of the lane and stood there. It was so last second that he couldn't react. 
and the, right, side mirror ended up hitting her in the head. He stopped, couldn't find her. Called the police and made a report. They never found her. I was hiking with my dad in late September 2018 on the west coast of Vancouver Island, which is usually when bears are fattening up for hibernation and most likely to be aggressive. Since we were a couple days walk from either trailhead, and medical attention, we were on high alert. It had rained constantly and we had only seen a single other hiker the whole time. He was traveling in the opposite direction as we were, he was heading north we were southbound and we had camped beside him two nights prior. So for the whole trip, the only tracks that we saw that looked remotely fresh were a single set of hiking boots coming left by a pleasant and solitary German tourist and we only saw them in places with extensive overhead cover. All other tracks were washed out and filled with rain water due to the days and days of constant rain that was doing the best it could to F up our vacation and make our packs even heavier. We were approaching a blackberry patch between ridges that hugged a small creek and smelled what we thought was a particularly stinky bear. Since the blackberries were on both sides of the trail with only about 3 meters between them, we had our heads on a swivel. There were no overhanging trees as this particular berry patch was dozens of meters across and 2 or more meters high. My dad told me to hurry through as quick as we could and made a comment about how smart it was that we were wearing bear bells and how dangerous it is to startle a feeding bear. He was a couple meters ahead of me when I looked down and saw a footprint. It looked like a bear human footprint, except that it was 2 inches wider and at least 2 inches longer than mine, and I have size 14 feet. It also had dermal ridges and only had a couple raindrops in it. So whatever made it had stepped there literally moments before. The scariest thing about it was that there were no other prints, so whatever had made that track had stepped out of the eastern side of the berry patch across the trail, 3 meters, and into the western patch in a single step. I was so startled. I looked around as much as I could before my dad told me to, hurry up. That was the only track there that wasn't now a small puddle. So before you discount it as a double-stepping bear paw print, where a bear's back paw steps into the print of its front paw, there is no way a black bear could have crossed that 3 meter distance without leaving more prints. Say what you want about bears, they are not at all graceful. There are also no grizzlies on the island, and a cougar wouldn't have left a print that looked anything like that, even if it stepped in its own track. It also couldn't have been a hoax because a person couldn't just stand in the berry patch with a pole with a footprint on it as they would be interacting with bears on a dangerously consistent basis. Also, why would someone sit in a berry patch in the relentless west coast rain in the hopes of pranking people who might not pass by for days? It doesn't really make sense to go to that much effort, risk that much danger, and basically swim in a lacerating blackberry bush for multiple days. I didn't believe in Sasquatch before that, but now I don't know what to believe. I was a service plumber for years and that smell is still in my top 5 worst smells of all time. And I will never forget the image of the raindrops hitting that fresh track, as I stared in disbelief. I am a truck driver, and I often drive by night to my hometown on weekends. It's about 200 American miles. It was dark and foggy with limited field of sight, some kind of animal ran across the road with big leaps. Usually you are able to see what kind of animal it is even if they're fast, but this time I could not figure out what it was. It was pretty fast, ran like a dog but looked like a skinny bear. Definitely not a wolf. This is in Sweden. I remember it giving me a quick glance running over, which looked creepy because of its eyes reflecting my car's light. Still don't know for sure what it was. The Bigfoot I saw in Temecula, California, in June 1985 was at night as I stopped on a dirt road. I couldn't drive any farther that night, and when I got out to do my business, I heard and saw it as I was finishing up. It did have an odor of something dead, like the decomposing body of a coyote. Anyway, 
It stood about 50 yards into a dry riverbed with trees about 45 feet of average height. I shined my flashlight in the direction of the smell and saw movement. But what may be different than most sightings is its eyes actually glowed bright blue and were about 11 feet tall judging by the tree height. Its eyes were just above a limb that I measured at 11 feet the next day. I had a 357 with me, but I had a feeling that it would not stop this creature if I were to shoot it in case it came for me. I left in a big hurry, and that Toyota truck just did not seem fast enough. That was the second time I had seen one. The first was back in March 1952 in the Sage area between Hemet, California, and Temecula, California. I went back the next day and measured the tree limb to his footprints, which were about 20 inches long and maybe 9 inches wide. This was a huge creature. I had a 357 I carried at all times with my own hot loads, a Colt Python with which I was very accurate. But it was so big I felt it would not stop it if he or she came for me. Do or don't take my word. I know that, 11 feet, is big, but that is what I believe it to be by the footprints and the tree limb. One difference from other sightings, except for the dead and foul smell, is this one difference, its eyes glowed a bright blue when a light was flashed in its eyes. And me being 70 yards away, which is fairly close, it is out there somewhere most likely. This area is close to the Pima Indian Reservation, which goes on down towards Mount Palomar Observatory a whole lot of forestry type land. I was part of alternative spring break trip at my university and was in a van and it happened a few years ago. We went from Michigan to Utah and we had a day off and we all decided to hop on our two vans and go to Arizona for the Grand Canyon. Well it was starting to get dark and it was such a beautiful experience to see. But then on the corner of my eye as I'm driving I notice in one of those remote desert houses that two men were throwing what looked like a human-sized bags into a ditch. To this day I keep thinking they were bodies being thrown into a ditch and buried or maybe stashing some drugs in the desert. They were too preoccupied to notice the vans and were a good distance from us to possibly notice but I can't shake the feeling of dread one what would have happened if they saw us or even imagine what could have been in those bags. I'm a retired 24-year veteran from the Canadian Forces and a scientist so naturally I don't speak often to people of this experience that happened to me in May of 2018. Just to be clear I was stone cold sober and I did not partake in drugs. It was on a Tuesday evening in Manitoba in a town of 2,600 people about 30 minutes south of Winnipeg. I noticed what I took to be a man sitting on my back deck looking away from the kitchen window checking my backyard. When I approached the window I began to shout at him asking what he was doing there. I immediately got a strange feeling that this person had no clue or desire to understand what I was saying. That was when I got a very good look at him. I noticed he was huge and covered in black fur approximately an inch long from head to toe and massive. I shrunk back from the window and grabbed a big knife from my knife block. I crawled upstairs to retrieve my bat and revolver, returned to the couch, and put the coppers over my head. I didn't want to be cornered upstairs in the bedroom. My wife had been on the phone when I saw it and told her about it the next day. I sat in the same spot after he silently left and knowing my height was 6 feet I stacked books up onto the point where my head had been the previous night and estimated his height to be 8 half feet tall. Of course, I couldn't sleep that night. The following evening at 3 am was sitting in the same spot and another visitor showed up. This time a young female. Now this might sound odd to say but she was about 7 half feet tall in height, young, and the body of a gymnast with a very attractive human face. I stood up and looked her in the face she immediately turned after a look of shock and bolted straight off the back deck in one giant leap and seemed to make a 90 degrees turn in mid-air and took off like a shot. The only thing I've ever seen move that fast was a black bear in Saskatchewan. The following day, in the afternoon, I saw standing on my driveway, a massive white-haired one with black roots was staring across my back lawn with a very annoyed look on his face. 
He stood at the height of the eaves on my back garage which would make him well over 10 feet tall. Again, I sat down and watched him stride across the width of the backyard and disappear. He moved like a ghost with no bounce to his stride. Very creepy. I sat for weeks afterward thinking, my lord I hope this isn't a habit for them. One begins to question their sanity in these moments but I knew what I saw and no one can convince me of otherwise. I live a five minute walk from the Seine River. I believe what I saw was a family passing through and that they use water to navigate. After weeks of shaking my head, I decided to visit the trails to the river and noticed someone had spray painted monkey trails on the sign to the entrance and then discovered clear signs of their passing through. There was a structure, sort of like a hunting blind, but the trees had not been cut but had been twisted and torn from the ground and were still green. Another had been carefully placed across the trail in a leaning fashion, wedged between two branches at a height no human could have reached. The strange thing about all three encounters was that I had no sense of malice and in fact, I had the feeling of being privileged. I have experienced their scent and presence. There have been no face-to-face -face encounters since so that's my story. Not my story, but my stepdad's story. He was going all around the US as a long-haul trucker, and he stopped by an abandoned town in Arizona. His friend said he'd give him like $10 or $20 to go inside it. When he did, his friend went with him. He asked his friend to take a picture of him in the town and they took a lot of them, but one of them had this weird creepy face on a window on the second floor of a building he was in front of. My stepdad and his friend were super creeped out and deleted it so they would never have to see that demonic ass thing ever again. He showed me various pictures of his trip through the town, and he told me about that story while we were looking at the pictures. Sent shivers down my spine man. I used to drive a lot late at night to see my girlfriend, usually stayed as late as 3 am then drove back the 3 to 5 miles home. I'd often be extremely tired. Staying up late and getting up early plus stress from uni meant I was exhausted driving home. At some point I started seeing people standing by the road in black outfits watching me, only from the corner of my eye. I could see them standing around looking at me, sometimes trying to get onto the road, sometimes I'd see a black dog on the road. The people freaked me out the most because they were more demonic in appearance but they looked so real, like they had physical weight to them and a presence. It escalated to the point where I was afraid to see them, so I stopped staying late. Only realized what was happening when I googled black dog or seeing black shapes when tired and driving. Apparently it's a form of dementia. I was hitchhiking one day on this old worn out highway in the middle of nowhere and a trucker picked me up. She was a portly old lady in her 60s. I tried to make small talk but she just stared out the window until she suddenly began to speak. On this very night, she said. 10 years ago. Along this same stretch of road in a dense fog just like this I saw the worst accident I ever seen. There was this sound like a garbage truck dropped off the Empire State Building. And when they finally pulled the driver's body from the twisting, burning wreck. It looked like this. Then she turned to face me and her skin started to melt off and her eyes bulged out while a haunting giggle filled the cabin. Her face returned to normal and she continues, yes sir. That was the worst accident I ever seen. Nervously I told her that I could get off at the diner we were approaching. As she pulled over and told me, be sure to tell them large Marge sent you. Before cackling as she pulled away. It was the damnest thing I've ever seen. My grandfather used to haul grain in Ohio. One day he was driving down the road when a random pickup truck he had never seen before pulls alongside the cab. The driver then pulls out a pistol and takes two shots right at my grandpa's window. Both missed him, thankfully but the window still shattered. The truck then just takes off at like 90 miles per hour. 
I know he called the police and I'm pretty sure they caught the guy but I'm honestly not sure of the details after the actual attack. All I know is it definitely was not somebody my grandpa knew, just some random guy felt like murdering that day I guess. Out hunting the outskirts of a remote campground on Happy Camp Mountain in the Six Rivers National Forest. My buddy and I found some old fabric that was under an old growth dead fall that was well rotted and the forest floor had started to consume it. There was lots of vegetation. It seemed to have been untouched for some time. We started to try to pull it out and were unsuccessful. Once realizing it was a tent we started to dig it out. We then realized it had something dense inside it. The fabric had started to fall apart. We were able finally remove the bulk of it. We were concerned we had found a body due to the weight as it was all wet. Once ripping it open we had a predator mask staring back at us and a ton of old wadded up clothes. Still one of the weirdest things I have ever seen. And that's saying a lot as I've seen Bigfoot. When I was living way up in the Appalachian Mountains, I'm in the foothills now, my house sat back in a holler on top of a hill. I was surrounded by woods in every direction and while I could hear the people's dogs that lived toward the bottom of the holler, and had one neighbor to the east, it was very secluded. If I walked off my porch I'd be in the woods within 8 or 9 steps. I like to walk with my dog in the woods and just enjoy the beauty, solitude and stillness of the place. One day my dog and I were walking through the woods and came upon the severed neck or head of a doe, like someone had slit its throat and just kept going until it was decapitated. There was no blood trail, it was fresh. The poor thing's eyes were open and there were no flies or bugs to be found, no smell and the kitchen knife was sticking out of its neck in at a weird angle. A crude, dull, shitty old plastic handled kitchen knife. People do not hunt in those woods, their private property and even if they did, you don't kill does. Certainly not at that time of year when they're fawning. That and the fact that I never, ever heard gunshots, I would have had to given how fresh a kill this was. My dog became very alert, not straying from my side and a feeling of unease washed over me. This was no more than 150 feet from my front porch. I went back there the next day and the head, neck or knife were gone. No trace of any of it. I don't know if I'm conveying how unnerving it was but I can see that scene like it was yesterday now, 10 years later. I actually always felt uncomfortable being there alone, especially at night. It just felt like I was being watched. Once in a rural very woodsy part of Wisconsin, my husband and I were walking a fence line to check out a piece of property we were considering buying. The woods were really dense and my husband had to help me through a lot of it as it was so thick. All of a sudden we came upon a circle which had been cleared out. The grass, the twigs, the bushy undergrowth was gone and it was just smooth circle. It looked kept up, there was nothing growing there. In the center of the circle was a small pyramid of black painted rocks, Maybe this was an altar? The rocks were like I said painted black. And in between the rocks was woven with what looked to me to be a long braid of someone's hair. I didn't touch it. It looked like a long braid and it went in and out of the rock formation. That's all there was. We didn't touch we just walked away. I was in remote wilderness location in Nova Scotia. Thin or vast, 250,000 hectares, wilderness of dense virgin forest with zero roads or trails. The whole area is untouched, and the only way of traveling is by kayak up rivers. We did some stargazing with the site lead guide and she knew her stuff. Been there for years and deeply knowledgeable about area and nature. We swapped stories of odd stuff. I talked about my experience of a giant floating orb in Kenya that freaked out an entire lodge incorporated guides that I've posted about before. She told us how last year they were on a kayaking exped in the wilderness when for three nights in a row the far night sky lit up with a white light. 
It didn't gain height or move and didn't match any known space launch trajectories or weather phenomenon. The nearest town was nearly 50 miles away, and there were no roads or anything similar where it was coming from. They've not seen anything similar before or since, but they were clearly spooked by a totally unexplainable event. Not a truck driver but I was driving one of those Isuzu box trucks from LA to Ridgecrest. I was driving through the winding roads of Red Rock Park or something. It was pitch black out and I had to take a leak so I pulled over. There were no cars around at all and it was crazy quiet. So I am taking a piss and I hear the most blood curdling scream and low growl I've ever heard. I pushed the rest of the pee out and hopped back in my truck and got out as fast as that shitty diesel could go. I've looked up the sounds a mountain lion makes and it wasn't that. To this day I don't know what it is and when I told somebody at China Lake about it he just told me I am lucky I wasn't murdered by some serial killer. It was one of those days with long working hours, working overtime to keep a client satisfied by finishing the product in time for installation. Means leaving late in the dark from an industrial complex and walk 300 meters to catch the bus in time to the train station. At first I didn't notice them, this group of runners. They seem like an ordinary bunch of regular runners. But then I noticed something. The pays it was like they run synchronized like military or something it was to damn perfect. I didn't give it much until the next night. Leaving late and I saw them coming running and approaching on the opposite of the street bicycle lane. So we like 20 meters apart. Street lights were a bit dim and nightfall already sunk in. As I watched the group all faced forward I turned my head to have a look see. They run precision wise like machines and then each one of them turned their head facing me just like that. And back running forward I didn't know what happened but the way they did it freaked me into walking faster ahead where there was more light. My heart pounded that wasn't normal I was thinking fricking twilight stuff half of the road I started running myself. There wasn't a next day for me anymore working overtime. Last summer I went out to a youth group conference on bus that took about 8 hours. While traveling there, I saw a van on the side of the road, most probably there because of a flat tire. There was a family outside of the van, which I presume they were trying to call a towing service. Three days later, and I'm traveling back from the conference in the middle of the night. I see the exact same van on the side of the road. It was different, however. Even though it had only been three days, it looked rusty and beat up. And all the windows, including the windshield and sunroof was smashed in. Blythe Island Regional Park and Campground near Brunswick, Georgia in 2018 or 2019. My then boyfriend, husband now, and I were primitive camping in the late spring. We had brought our mountain bikes with us and decided to hit some of the trails in the park. I was new to it and overweight at the time. I was poking along and going slower than my partner. I took lots of breaks between gasping for breath and trying not to fall. Well during one of those breaks, I noticed a long khaki colored trench coat sleeve in the pinky side of an adult man's fist, right arm, clearly visible from one side of a tree he's standing behind. He was in the woods off to my right about 15 feet off the trail. He was comically out of place in the muggy woods, in the southeast on morning quickly warming up to the mid 80s. Think about wearing a trench coat with the bugs, heat, humidity, and swampy forest in the deep south. As I looked at the trench coated arm or man fist I realized that he was unmoving and quiet. A creep, lovely. He was hiding from the folks traversing the trails. Alarm bells slowly went off as I realized he could hear my out of shape as struggling to catch my breath and chug water for a couple minutes there in a shitty hiding spot. Real quick on the uptake there I know. In my defense, cardio sucks. So I stood there for a beat, having caught my breath, and stared at the arm. I swear I felt the moment he realized that I'd seen him. I got chills all over my body in it, finally, 
occurred to me to move my ass. I ungraciously hop on the bike and catch up to my, L.E.O., man in an impressive show of plum-scared adrenaline. I told him about the man. Aside from looking dazed at my lack of survival instinct, opposites attract, he instantly decided that we just needed to move further down the trail. So we did. We eventually got to this little dock that is on the Atlantic side of the the park which services a tower and navigation beacon for the ships moving through that area. Sticking out from under the service dock was large off-white storage tote, something that would go on a boat. The material it was made of was similar to an ice chest but it was not as deep as an ice chest would be. I was curious about the tote. My guy was more inclined to leave it alone but irrational minds prevailed and we opened it up. Inside was a single retro incest porn magazine. We had come across a forest prawn stash and presumably a forest jacker in a trench coat failing to hide in the woods. My partner did let the park's office know about the creep and the prawn we had come across several kids on those trails who didn't need to find that stuff. When I was a kid, our property bordered a nature preserve that was a few hundred acres of thick woods. My siblings and I would spend all day hiking around and would find some pretty cool things. We found arrowheads, dilapidated buildings that were barely standing, and lots of run-ins with wildlife. The creepiest thing we came across though was a duffel bag buried under some leaves and sticks. It smelled horrible but that didn't stop us from being convinced there was treasure inside. There was no treasure, just a mess of bloody organs and whatever else we were too scared to investigate. We ran home to tell our parents that we had found a dead body in the woods and my dad and a neighbor had us lead them out to where it was. They sent us home while they checked it out and when they got back told us it was not a person but that we weren't allowed to hike out there alone anymore. We spent many years after that convinced we had found a dead body and our parents just didn't want us to know. As adults my dad finally admitted that it was a bunch of deer entrails that someone had discarded after field dressing, but since it was a nature preserve whoever was out there was poaching and that was why they didn't want us out there alone. Not my story but my sister's, she went on a night hike with several friends and her really big dog in western Colorado a couple of years ago. On the hike back down, they started to get hit by rocks and berries being thrown from the bushes, and he dog was really spooked by something. They ran back to the cars at the trailhead, and while she loaded the dog in the back seat, she saw a tall, pale human-like form running across the parking lot. Running faster than a normal person could. She said it was extremely white and unclothed. And this is why we do not go on night hikes in the woods, y'all. I was with my cousin in the woods near our homes in West Virginia, back in the 90s, and we came across this old cemetery on a ridge. We explored it for a bit then moved on. A little further down the ridge we came to a point where we could see my parents' house, which sat down in a valley, and about halfway up the hillside on the opposite side of my parents' house we saw another, definitely abandoned house within the trees. Neither of us had seen that house before but assumed it must have just been because we never really spent much time on that hillside. We went on about our day and ended up forgetting about it, until around 10 years later when my parents were talking about an old house that had set on that hillside, which had burned down in the 80s, before I was born. That sparked the memory for me, and I called my cousin to confirm. He remembered seeing the house, so I went back to my parents and told them. I explained the look of the house, style, position of the windows, the front porch, etc. And they said it matched the house they were talking about. It's possible my cousin and I both had a false memory of this, as memories are weird, but I always found it curious that we potentially saw a house that had burned down years before either of us were born. I went to high school in Waco. As a senior most of my friends were already out of school. We drove to Temple to an old two-story house in the middle of nowhere. 
It had a bar or dance floor on the bottom and a pool hall upstairs. We listened to the music for a while but the smoke got too thick for me and I asked my friends to step outside to air out. We went and sat on the curb next to the parking lot. As soon as I sat down it felt like someone had opened a freezer door behind me and I felt a rush of very cold air. It was the middle of a Texas summer. I jumped up and asked where are we? I turned to look. It was a graveyard. We left right away but had to travel rural country roads to go home. There were weird bands of clouds floating above the road for most of the way. They would hit the car about windshield level split then go around the car. It was really freaky. Two friends and myself went hiking in the desert hills of New Mexico. As we climbed up the canyon we came into an area that seemed like a natural theater room. Along the rock walls were all kinds of inscriptions that looked like astrological symbols. I don't know. It had many spots that were melted wax. There was an altar too that had melted wax like candles were left to completely burn. Further up along the cliff side, I found binoculars with a built-in camera. They were pretty weathered. There was a pair of broken sunglasses next to them. As we go across the canyon and into a cave, there were more odd symbols in it and with vials of liquid that looked like water. Inside the cave floor were clothing. Looked like men's clothes. We dug with branches and kept pulling up clothes until we gave up. We hiked back down to the base of the canyon and there were many large, black trash bags and for sure we thought they were bodies but every one of them was full of clothing. Men's, women's, children's clothes. We also found women's underwear thrown into brush and cacti. If that was not weird enough, when we continued walking along the canyon floor, I spotted a pack of cigarettes resting on a ledge and those were pretty new and only one cigarette was removed from the pack. It was if someone just took off running and left the cigarettes behind. It was a bizarre afternoon for sure. We don't know if it was a cult or homeless people there or a cult possibly sacrificing homeless people there. Who knows? I know that we saw no blood for sure. While hiking a specific mountain trail with my husband and dog, we were climbing some switchbacks up to the wall of the mountain. The last switchback ran across the mountain wall to a dead-end waterfall. Only one way up and down. It was a decent two-mile hike up the path. While midway up the switchbacks, our dog starts panicking. We look up, and on the last switchback, there is a guy in full snow suit gear watching us full face mask and yellow goggles. It was barely October and not that cold at all. He starts walking towards the falls, and we lose sight of him. Husband and I are kind of creeped out, but figured it was someone hiking to the falls as well. Made it to the falls. No one was there. We never saw this guy again. He disappeared into thin air. There was no way he got down, no other trail. I have a hundred or so unexplainable stories about one of the most haunted cemeteries Bachelors Grove outside Chicago. I've had some in your face encounters. Also seen the ghost house that disappears many times. Experienced the white dog as well. It is true no matter how had the wind blows it never blows inside the cemetery gates. We used to smoke pot in that cemetery but the spirits liked me and my group of friends because we were respectful. They would mess with us playfully. There was one night they did not want us in the cemetery. They definitely let us know it. The spirits were very serious on the night. A rock hound which usually leads us deep into the boonies. We were in the Utah West Desert right outside of Wendover. It was a dirt road but not that far off the beaten path only a mile or two from the gas station and freeway exit. We were headed to a spot we have been to several times. We like it because it's far enough away to be an adventure but not too far from SLC anyways there are several dirt roads that branch off this main path. 
We passed one of those paths and saw a bunch of stuff in the path so we slowed down out of curiosity and to be safe in case there was something on our path too. As we got closer we saw there were dozens of dead jackrabbits. They looked like they were arranged in lines not like tossed in a heap. After we realized what they were we just kept on going and kept our head on a swivel the rest of the day. I don't know what's up that path but I'm not going to find out. That was the first and only time to see that on our trips to that specific spot. We have probably been out there close to a dozen times by now but we always stick to the correct path. Nothing good comes from taking random dirt roads in the west desert. Usually you just get lost, been there done that, but sometimes you will find crazy people who don't want to be bothered. This story took place in Louisiana back in the 1940s from the back seat of a car while looking out the window. I was about 8 years old and I was sitting in the back seat of the car while looking out the window. My father was a doctor and whenever there was an automobile accident, he always stopped to render aid. This was in the 1940s. There were only two lane highways, so collisions were fairly common. The car might have been stopped for that reason at the time or we were driving very slowly, but I looked out my window on the left side and on the shoulder of the highway in the opposite lane was a tiny horse drawn wagon with a tiny driver. The horse was about 8 inches from nose to tail as I looked down on it and the driver was in proportion. The wagon was kind of a dingy red farm type wagon. At the time I did not think the sighting was miraculous or even odd and I didn't say anything to my parents, but all I remember is that I wanted to take the tiny beings home to play with. Although I remember it vividly, I gave it little thought for years, but in later life, I started reading about elementals and fairy beings and realized I'd had an actual sighting. I have had no sightings since. They seemed unaware of me or anything, but what they were doing, which was a fairy man driving a horse-drawn wagon, the wagon and horse about the size that could fit in an apple carton. If seen, what did the fairy or fairies look like? I saw a tiny, 8-inch horse-drawn wagon being driven by a tiny man. The wagon, horse, and man all looked like real living beings in perfect proportion the wagon was a dingy red the horse brown but i don't remember anything specific about the driver i heard no sounds it was on a highway in louisiana and no one talked about fairies i don't remember even having heard about fairies at the time i was about 8 years old why do you think your experience was a fairy experience as opposed to a ghost or an alien or an angel or some other type of anomalous experience i was a child wide awake at the time and i knew nothing about ghosts or aliens and little about angels i now believe that fairies exist and are basically soul like beings that vibrate at a range of frequencies that humans can't see unless certain circumstances allow it I never read fiction or non-fiction stories about fairy beings until many years later, when I was around 30 years old, and I started reading about elementals and other fairy beings in a book entitled The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. Since then, I have researched more. The memory of my fairy sighting is still vivid after over 70 years. My wife and I have had the same mattress since we have been married. It is lumpy, dips horribly in the middle, and isn't large enough now that our daughter sleeps on it with us. I know, that's dangerous and not recommended at all. But when you go 6 straight months without more than an hour of sleep at a time you eventually cave in. With that being said, I'm always on the lookout for a good deal on a king-size mattress and yesterday I found one. $125 for a new set and not a cheap one either. Incredible, right? I thought so too, so I called the guy up and asked if it was still available. You know how sometimes they advertise something really cheap because it doesn't exist. To my surprise it was so I set up for my wife and daughter to go out and take a look at 5 p.m. I would have rather just gone myself instead of dragging my cranky daughter all the way into downtown but my wife is pretty particular about the firmness of the mattress so I had to make sure it was comfortable for her. Brian, the guy selling the mattress, 
said to call when we were on our way so he would know when to meet us at the storage site. I called but it went to voicemail so I left one and also texted him to let him know we are on our way. The whole drive there my wife and I are chatting happily about how great it will be to finally have a new mattress and have our own space in the bed once again. My daughter likes to sleep at a bit of a diagonal so that her hands are touching mommy's shoulder and her feet are touching my leg. It is very sweet and cute but also incredibly uncomfortable because I have to sleep on the knife's edge of the bed in order to not crush anyone. Dad's out there I am sure you can relate. Fortunately the traffic isn't too bad yet so we make it right on time. I hate being late to appointments. It is just so unprofessional and inconsiderate, you know? I get out of the car and unstrap my daughter so that she can enjoy the cool breeze and point to all the new things she sees while we wait for Brian to arrive. After about 15 minutes I walk into the office of the storage facility and ask to see if Brian maybe works there or if the receptionist knows anything about him. She told me that he works for a home staging company for when people try to sell their homes. That is why we can buy the mattress so cheap. It is unpackaged and set up so they can't resell it in a store. She assured me he was a great guy and was probably just running late due to traffic. I was glad I talked to her because I was still having a few doubts about why the mattress was such a good deal but his line of work made a lot of sense. My daughter and I walked around some more, singing songs and feeling the brick wall of the building and the nylon threads of the American flag swaying in the breeze. She is a very happy, sweet girl and loves to feel new things so I didn't notice how much time had passed until my wife popped out of the car and asked what was going on. 40 minutes had passed. This guy was ridiculously late. I handed off my daughter so that I could call him up and see what the deal was. This is Brian. Yay, hi, this is Steven. We had a 5 p.m. meeting to look at a mattress. Where are you at, bud? Oh yay okay I am 30 minutes away, I'll be there soon. Now as you know I hate being late. I also hate when others are late. Seriously? It is 5.35 PM and we agreed to 5 PM, Brian. Don't bother, we are leaving. I told you to call me when you were leaving so that I knew you were coming. This is the first time you are calling me so now I am coming. What? Look, Brian. I called you when we left our house and I left you a voicemail. I texted you to let you know we were on the highway. We agreed to 5 PM and you stood us up. I dragged my daughter and wife out here for no reason and now we have to fight traffic to get back home. Thank you for wasting our time. I hung up before he could get another word in. I was furious. Who sets a time to meet but then doesn't show up until the person calls. Clearly this guy wasn't a real businessman. He called me right back but I ignored it. We needed dinner and showers, we had routines to follow or this baby was going to be up all night. He texted me right after trying to justify his reasoning, telling me I was foolish for not wanting to wait around to save so much money on a $1,000 mattress. Obviously this guy didn't have kids. I added his number to my spam list so that I wouldn't get any more calls or texts from him and apologize to my wife for wasting our evening. I work two jobs to make enough for the bills and we don't have much time together as a family. I feel like a bit of a failure but my wife always reassures me, thanking me for working so hard. Still, I can't shake the sadness I feel when I come home late and barely get to spend any time with them so I was extra frustrated with Brian for wasting one of my only free evenings. Of course traffic was awful heading back out of downtown and there were two car accidents because why not add insult to injury? My daughter was starting to get fussy so I was singing all her favorite songs and making silly faces to keep her occupied. It took over an hour to get home but once we hit the driveway everything was forgotten and we all smiled. Home at last. We went through our normal routine of dinner and bath time and instead of turning on the television I just played with my daughter until she was ready for bed. It was a nice change of pace. I can't believe how big she is getting. The alarm went off far too early for my liking but I got up and did my best to crawl out of the dip in the bed without arousing anyone else. Got dressed, packed a lunch, ate a quick breakfast and I was off to work. 
The day was pretty uneventful which was nice because I couldn't keep my eyes open easily. Normally I get a few calls from my wife during the day and at least one picture showing our daughter doing something silly or new but I didn't get any of that today. I knew they had a few plans to go to the petting zoo and story time at the library so I didn't think much of it although I did miss my daily picture. Wednesday is always a special day because it's food pantry day. At first we were just embarrassed but we try to make the best of it by guessing what dessert they will give us. The generosity of people in our area is so amazing. They donate all organic foods, even organic meat. I usually make it home before my wife is done at the pantry so I tidy up the house and get ready to go out and grab all of the bags full of food. I kicked off my work boots and put my lunch bag away, cleaning up a few dishes in the sink and washing down my daughter's high chair tray. As I headed into the bedroom to change into more comfortable clothes, I stopped dead in my tracks. There, in place of our small, lumpy bed was the king-sized mattress on a simple bed frame. It even had sheets on it, nice ones. A few tears gathered at Eda because I realized why my wife never called me today. She was busy surprising me with a new bed. She must have found Brian's ad on Craigslist and went up to meet him on her own while I was at work. What a wonderful woman she is. On the bed was a small, white card. I rushed over to it, flopping onto the bed and taking the card in my hand to read. Dear Stephen, I hope you like the mattress. Don't worry about payment. I already took what I needed. Brian, what the hell? I sprang up off of the bed and went to my phone, calling my wife. No answer. No problem. She is probably wrapping up at the food pantry or driving home. She never answers when she is driving. I waited 15 more minutes before calling again. She is never this late from coming home. 4:15 at the latest and it was already 4:30. I called again, straight to voicemail. I tried not to panic, tried to let my imagination run wild, but I couldn't help it. Was she in an accident? Is she stuck in traffic? Please answer. After another 20 minutes and no response from her, I drove over to the food pantry and found the managing volunteer just before they closed up for the night. Hey Terry, was my wife here today? Oh, hi Stephen. No, she never came today. I was a bit surprised myself, but I thought maybe you finally found a better job and didn't need to come anymore. I drove home much faster than the law or safety would dictate, praying that her car would be in the driveway. but it wasn't i tried calling one more time with no luck sprinting around the house i searched for anything strange or missing that is when i noticed the picture frame on our nightstand the picture was torn down one side leaving just me tears started flowing down my face coating my phone as i dialed 911 just a quick update or answer of various questions from the comments first thank you all for your concern The local police and I are doing everything we can to try and locate my family. I will let you know as soon as I hear anything positive or negative regarding the case. Secondly, I understand that Craigslist can be shady. I have dealt many times with buying and selling without ever having an issue for many years. Please understand I am in a difficult financial position right now, which is why I even looked around for a mattress on Craigslist. We go to a food pantry every week. So yes times are tough. I can only do what I can do. So far we are unsure of how Brian found our home or got in. There was no signs of a forced entry and no record of anyone calling or texting my wife or her calling or texting anyone over the course of the day outside of actual contact saved to her phone. She received no emails either. Our neighbors did not notice a moving truck or anything similar come by during the day but obviously something had to have come by. Still no idea about that either. Update 2. The police have put out my wife and daughter's picture to try and get the word out. I went up to the storage facility to try and talk to the receptionist but it was a new woman today. She looked up storage units owned by a Brian and there was not a single unit. Can you believe that? over 1400 units and not a single Brian. I mean, it's a common name. I feel like something is getting covered up so I'm coming back later to snoop around on my own. 
I also unblocked the number and tried to call but all I get is a disconnected number message. The police are trying to track it to a house or business but they aren't telling me much, which worries me more than anything else. Oh and since so many have mentioned my family being in the mattress, the police took the mattress as evidence. They checked it inside and out for clues. They are not inside it. Part 2. So like I said in my first post I unblocked Brian's number and tried to get in touch with him again but it said it was disconnected. Of course I gave the number to the police to try and track but I have yet to hear any news from them, which is incredibly discouraging. They say you only have 48 hours to find a missing person and I am approaching that number very quickly. I can't. I just can't lose my family. My wife is the sweetest, most loving and wonderful mother to our beautiful, vibrant daughter. I remember when she was born and, sorry. I have been thinking a lot about that night. I guess it is the only thing pushing me on. I have to find my family. One of the comments mentioned checking my car for a tracking device. Don't know why I didn't think of it before so I went out last night before I went to work and after a few minutes of checking I did find something under the rear bumper, on my exhaust pipe. I don't know if it is a tracking device or what but I turned it in to the police on my way to work. Why didn't they think to check my car? Anyway I didn't really feel like working much. I was distracted and exhausted. My boss told me to take a few nights off, paid, to clear my head. I couldn't believe it, not because it is out of the ordinary but he is just a hard ass most of the time I didn't think he had a soft spot on him. I took full advantage of it by heading back up to the storage site to see if I could find anything. Like I mentioned in my first post I worked two jobs, one being warehouse stocking overnight and during the day I worked for a home security company called Vivin Installing and Servicing Home Systems. One of the neat things we offer is a camera that you can access from anywhere in the world and watch a live stream. Most people use it as a nanny cam or to see what their pets do while they are gone but I had a great idea. I'd set one up on the roof and then I could watch it from my work laptop to see if anyone is moving mattresses around. If I could get a visual on the guy we could catch him. So I headed up to the site and climbed up the backside of one of the buildings that had the humidity controlled units. According to the receptionist they only have 24 of these units and since they are selling a ton of mattresses I figured that is a unit they would need to have. There were cameras all over the place so I couldn't get a perfect angle or see the whole row of units but I was able to place it in such a way that I could see about two thirds of them. Not ideal but better than nothing. The camera is tiny so I wasn't worried about anyone finding it and I know it can run for over 6 months on a fresh battery. Since I don't have anywhere to sleep at home I decided I'd just recline the seat in my car and try to snooze a little while keeping an eye on the footage. Now I know a lot of you are probably thinking there is no way Brian is ever coming back to that place. And while I agree with you, what else can I do? I have to have hope, to believe they are still alive and unhurt. It is the only thing keeping me going. I am sure you can understand that. I must have actually fallen asleep because a train horn startled me and I jerked up, knocking the laptop off of my lap. The train was moving pretty slowly, even slower than most around here and there was a van and a few cars waiting at the crossing. It took a moment to remember where I was and rub the sleep out of my eyes. It was 3 AM. I rewound the footage in triple speed to see if anyone had shown up during the hour and a half that I was laying there and only 20 minutes before a 15 passenger van showed up just inside the frame of the camera. It was hard to tell but I am pretty sure it was the receptionist that was there the day we came to buy the mattress. Two guys were hauling mattresses out of the back of the van and into one of the units. I started to get excited. I had him. I found him. Then I got sick to my stomach. From inside of the unit came five women, most of them older but one was pretty young. I couldn't see their faces because of the distance from the camera but I could see that they were chained together and gagged with something. One of the guys gave something to the receptionist lady, most likely money, and they piled into the van and drove off. Wait, I thought, didn't I just see a van? I looked up and the train was gone the cars that were waiting now far off in the distance. 
I turned on my car and took off after the fading taillights, praying I'd be able to catch up and hope they hadn't already turned off somewhere. I grabbed my phone and called the police, telling them everything that transpired and where I was or direction I was heading. They told me to pull over and to stop following but screw that, I floored it even more and tried to close the distance. Pretty soon I heard sirens from several different directions but I had lost sight of the van, or maybe never had sight of it. When I finally caught up to the taillights I was chasing they belonged to a Corolla or something. About that time my phone went off. It was the police, they had found the van. I drove my way over, only a few blocks east of where I was, hoping for good news. When I got there they had two men in cuffs in the back of a squad car which left soon after. Five women were laying on gurneys being tended to by medical staff, but none were my wife or daughter. I was relieved, happy, thankful that they were safe, but also devastated. Where was my family? After interrogation or whatever of the men and the women that were saved it was determined that they would have been sold as slaves, human trafficking. The police are still looking for my family, of course, but they aren't acting very positive about the whole thing. I just left my day job because my boss caught me still watching footage of the unit and told me to just go home. I know it sounds stupid but what else can I do? I can't eat or sleep or even think without feeling the need to vomit. My family, slaves. Sold to some freak that will do God knows what to them? My 11 month old daughter. So beautiful, so innocent. Daddy is going to find you. Update. So far no one has come back to that unit other than police. I watched them drag everything out, sick to my stomach. I watched their cars drive off full of evidence. Everyone seems to have vanished that was connected to this aside from the two guys that were arrested. They haven't given up any information from what the station is telling me. I don't know why but I started to browse Craigslist again to see if any new ads were put up similar to the one I had responded to. I didn't find anything but I did remember a few stories I'd heard about the deep web or dark web and how human trafficking goes down on those sites. I dove head first into that awful area of cyberspace trying to find anything that could help me find my family. The things I found only made me that much sicker and more worried about my family. Who could do such things to fellow human beings? I know we are in a sick, confused world but oh. I will just stop there. I don't want to upset anyone by the things I saw. After an hour of searching I was about to give up when I found something hosted by BMK. I had seen it before and passed it by but looking at it again jogged my memory. The only reason it stood out to me at all is because of the Craigslist ad. Brian had called himself the Mattress King. It is a pretty standard claim, to be fair, but I didn't think I could pass up an opportunity even if it wasn't him. I responded to it with an old email I hadn't used since probably high school and got a response almost immediately. $5,000 cash for a female. $4,000 for a male. Discounts for age. An address to meet at and a time. When I plugged the address in I was surprised to see how close it was to the storage facility. One of your comments was right, they kept operations close. Obviously I don't have the cash but I have a gun. What Midwesterner doesn't? I am on my way right now. I don't want to be late. Final update. So as I said I like being early and I figured my old pal Brian would be late to this arrangement. I got there an hour ahead of time to scope out the place and find a good spot to take him out. I found a nice loft where I could overlook the big, open factory floor. I parked my car a ways away at a thrift store parking lot and walked to it with a guitar case, hiding my 22. I guess they would probably have a few people out front waiting for me to come in and Brian inside with the lineup of women. Fortunately I guessed correctly. A total of six armed people showed up, four taking position somewhere outside. Brian and the receptionist stood inside with 20 women. My heart skipped a beat when I saw my wife among them. I almost cried out right then and there but I stifled it in time. I took careful aim and busted Brian's knee with the first shot. I'm assuming he went into shock because he dropped and laid there moaning for the entirety of my visit. 
My next shot took out the receptionist as she ran. The girl started screaming right away, obviously not knowing what was going on. A guy from outside came in but I was already back outside on my way down. I have never been happier than right then about my granddad forcing me to go hunting every year and earn my dinner. It was paying off. It was then that I called the police. I waited until sirens were nearing before I shot the next two guards in the leg. Suffer for your sins. I made my way inside and used one of the guards handguns to finish Brian and the other guy with him after I let him see my face. I don't think my wife even noticed me until I put my hand on her face. I'm not sure where the last one ran off to but he didn't bother us as I unlocked the women and hugged my wife. Where's my baby? Is she okay? She just shook her head. We cried, oblivious to the police filtering in. It was about 2 am driving around aimlessly as I always did after work, night shift, to try and relax before heading home. I was going through the town next over because of the twisty roads I always enjoyed going down for the thrill. This time however I had a weird mental note to myself about using my high beams for once as I never do so I listened to my gut feeling and turned them on before the road began twisting. Right as the first bend came up there was a deer almost entirely split in half trying to walk across the road. I mean this poor thing it may be only a few strands of muscle or intestinal organs holding its back legs and front legs together. It could be a coyote that attacked the deer but the way this thing was so badly injured I just figured someone hit it except there was no other drivers on the road behind me or in front of me for about 20 minutes. Story time. When I was a young teen, there was a small forest fairly near our house. My neighbor and I would walk to it regularly to go build dens and play on the park near its edge. The land was clearly once part of an estate because it had an old 1900s looking swimming pool and bits of stone path dotted amid the undergrowth. We'd sometimes take other kids there and play chase games or pretend to be tribes people, sprinting through the thick foliage. It was a fun place to explore, especially after we discovered where the stash of crispy old woods porn was. It looked like it was from the 70s. Anyway, We'd been going there for about a year or so at weekends when we finally decided to take a big pair of garden shears to start clearing an area for our biggest den yet. We chose part of the forest that had always been blocked off to us because it was mostly surrounded by a thick wall of bamboo, overgrown from the place's time as an estate I think. The forest was a paradise just for us, we'd never ever seen anybody there other than us or people we brought. The porn in our dens were always exactly as we left them. But all the same, we figured cutting a secret way into the bamboo walled area would give the best protected den from strangers and barbarians and ninjas. It took us most of the day to cut our way in. When we'd made an arch to crawl through, we went in to find that we were in a clearing with only clovers growing in it, no taller plants, just a soft blanket of clovers. Dotted throughout were these odd little knee-high statues of fairies sitting on stone mushrooms playing harps and other instruments. Every single one had its face smashed off. In the center of the cramped clearing was a giant concrete-looking block. We kicked over one of the fairy statues on the way over to it, probably to demonstrate that we weren't scared. It was a giant rough stone coffin. Some ivy-like plant covered most of it but it clearly had a well-defined lid and a worn, unreadable inscription on the side. Adrenaline curious, we tried with all our might to lift the lid, but it must have weighed tons. The adrenaline wore off, we freaked out, and hurriedly walked back through to the play park where we sat and discussed our find for a bit. We decided the clearing was too den perfect to pass up, so the next day we returned with some old metal sheeting and plywood boards to build our shelter. It wasn't raining, but the day was heavily dark and overcast, so the woods were about at the darkest they could be during daytime. We got back into the clearing, started building, and got pretty far with it. After a little while my friend sort of yelped out an oh Jesus Christ. I turned to see him stood next to the coffin, it's giving me full body shivers just thinking about this, and it was open. 
The lid was slid off to one side just enough that a thin person could get through the gap. I ran over, stared into the gap, saw nothing but pitch dark, and whispered run. The wind rose and it started raining, so there was noise everywhere right at that moment. I've never experienced anything like it. We ran through the wood faster than we'd ever practiced in our tribe games. We never went back into those woods. Anyway, we went back earlier and everything was totally overgrown. Also seeing as I'm now 6 foot 5 inches it was even harder to move around. We managed to find some of the landmarks but every path I remember leading to or near the clover clearing was now gone. We spent a few hours getting lost and they're trying to find ways around the back of it. But unfortunately it looks like it's gone until some new kid cuts their way in. Oh, and of course the woodsporn has long since dissolved away. Sorry, no vampires, but I can tell you it was creepy, particularly the way that the clearing seemed inaccessible and the fact that that cabin seems to have sprung from nowhere. I understand that a story like this may come off as unbelievable which is one of the reasons why I've never told anybody about it for quite a long time. With the entire world and the state that it is in, I figured now is probably a better time to share my story. Now, for a little information about myself, I'm 30 years old. I've been an active duty park ranger for the past six and a half years in one of America's national parks. Before that, I served four years in the US Marine Corps. During my tenure in both, I held numerous security clearances, received extensive training on protecting sensitive information, and worked with various federal agencies, including NSA and DHS, to name a couple. Those are just the outliers of things I've done and people I've worked with, but by no means do I consider it a bragging right. Basically, I know how to keep my mouth shut about sensitive information when necessary. Consider the fact that if there was a chance of somebody believing me or the story getting out in public, it would have happened by now, I'm sure. Now, let's get to the meat and potatoes. About five years ago, I was a very young ranger in one of our national parks, which I will not name. It's a very popular place for hikers and campers. At that time, my duties were pretty much relegated to being a rover, patrolling the trails and checking up on campsites. I was not a full-fledged ranger but more of an assistant. I would shadow and assist many of the rangers while on duty, doing various forms of work, including search and rescue. In addition to that, I was tasked with safety briefings when tours from the visitor centers brought in folks. At this point, it should be noted that most of my co-workers at this early stage of my career were much older than me, by double or triple. While I'm not trying to whine about this, it played a role in how things planned out later on. One morning during the summer season, I was asked to do safety briefings for a group of visitors who had been touring the area assigned to me that day. The briefing itself wasn't anything special, and everything went smoothly enough. After the tour, I went back to my usual trail and continued with what I needed to do. The trail was not anything too special, just yet another trail looping around the base of the mountain leading off into some woods. A couple of other trails were branching off, but they were pretty unnoticeable unless you were specifically looking for them. A few hours later, I finished up all my tasks and decided to take a nice break on one of our overlooked points, kind of like an observation deck. It was nice, with a shade covering over half of it, making sitting very comfortable. After sitting down, I noticed somebody coming down the trail behind me in the distance. I didn't pay much attention to it, thinking as long as they don't come near me, we coexist just fine. As they got closer, I realized this person was wearing all black with a hood over their head. Normally, this wouldn't be anything special past the halfway point of my break, but what caught my attention was that this person had a very strange gait, almost as if they were floating on the ground. They showed no signs of breathing difficulty or tiredness in their legs. They moved robotically, with precision and execution that looked unnatural. I only had my awareness at half capacity because of my break, so I wasn't paying much attention. But as they got about 10 feet away, I tried to make small talk with them. 
They said nothing back, but their head turned slowly towards me. It took a few seconds for this whole exchange to happen, but when it did, this figure looked straight down at me, since I was sitting, and kept walking forward without missing a beat. I was horrified when I got a look at their face. It was like staring into the face of Emperor Palpatine, deformed and grey looking. It was terrifying, and even their eyes looked unnatural. They just kept on going, and that is what really made me notice their movements. It all just looked so wrong. I pulled my head away for a second to grab my radio. When I looked back up, they were suddenly gone. I remember sitting there, thinking to myself, okay, there was no way they could have disappeared so fast. There's nowhere on or off the trail that they could go to fully conceal themselves, not like that. To make a long story short, I got the creeps and decided to get out of there. Originally, I was going to radio back about this person, but the whole thing was so weird that I could not shake it off. So, now you're probably wondering why I am sharing this. Well, because two days after this happened, another ranger came up to me and told me about an experience he had while patrolling an area near where I was at. He also got weirded out by my story too, apparently. They found a dead deer on the side of the trails. When they approached the body, this deer had all of its organs and blood completely removed. The deer had not been cut open, and there were no signs of flies or any decay, even though it had been dead for well over 12 hours. There were no bite marks, puncture wounds, or anything that would indicate it had been cut open in any way. It was as if somebody had killed this deer and just dumped it on the trail. Upon closer examination, they could not find the cause of death or how this deer died. It was as if it had suddenly fallen over and died, yet its eyes, tongue, heart, lungs, and other organs were all missing. There were also no tracks or any sign of a struggle when they found the deer. So, I guess the real reason I'm sharing this is that I want to know what you guys think about it. If any of you have had experiences like mine or have heard about weird things happening in the area, I would love to know. Thank you for reading my post, and feel free to discuss these events further. This happened not so late ago, maybe a few days. My name is Carl and I had this trip planned for three weeks. Me and my friends got on the meeting point and got in the car to finally start the trip we have always wanted. It was me, Josh, Carla, and Mark, and luckily they all made or to bring as much camping supplies for this, given that we believed it was better safe than sorry. It was a long two-hour drive until we reached our destination. I think it was called Marshland Campground or something. I didn't really pay much attention to the sign since I wasn't the one driving. After we reached a good location, we got our things unloaded and started setting up camp, first our tents and then some other things like parking the car on a better position and then gathering things for a campfire. As we finished and sat down to talk, a park ranger showed up from a nearby trail. He looked like your average park ranger, and with his grumpy voice spoke to us. Hey kiddos, I know you're all settled down to camp and all but I do tell you that some places are off limits, Terry signs and all that crap saying it, so take my word and don't venture off. Of course, some pretty standard stuff, maybe some preservation areas where visitors were not allowed to camp or visit. After he walked away, we continued to chat like nothing happened. After a bit of talking we decided to hike on the trail and see if there was any place to visit like a souvenir shop or a local shop. As we went, we saw some parts that were boarded with tall metal frames and electric fences. Upon a closer look, there were signs like the ranger said, it read stay off, dangerous wildlife in the area. Along with symbols of different animals like wolves, foxes, spiders, bears, and something I couldn't make off, it looked like a quadrupedal animal of sorts that I didn't know about. Me and Josh joked about them keeping monsters hidden in the forest, getting a laugh together. As the night fell early, it started to rain heavily, probably a storm, so we rushed into our tents, and since the group wasn't sleepy just yet we kept chatting through our phones since signal was still present. We heard some loud sounds outside and went to investigate, 
It was coming from far away from our camp, maybe a vehicle? We got our raincoats and flashlights, Josh also got us some hunting knives just in case, along with bear spray. We tried to locate the source of the sound and, as we hid in the bushes, we saw some staff opening a huge gate inside the prohibited area, as they sent animals like cows and pigs inside. Of course, this was already sketchy enough, but we couldn't exactly assume what they were doing. But the next thing we heard was the sound of said animals apparently running around, the sound of shock as a few of them ended up running to the electrical fence. We wanted to run away, but curiosity got the best of us as we stayed hidden to watch it all. We saw the light posts that illuminated the trail starting to flicker, and soon the place was dark save for the headlights of the truck. Lightning striked every so often, and we saw something move in the prohibited area, it was quadrupedal, had a muscular back and if I could guess was around the size of a large horse, but that's all we could see. Soon a deafening roar echoed around as the side of metal clanks started being heard. If that couldn't be worse, we also heard the staff screaming. We saw faintly one trying to get into the truck before being pulled back by something. It was an impossible to see, but definitively gruesome horror show. We saw a lit up flashlight illuminating in one direction and that's when we saw it. Quadrupedal, a long body, probably 25 or more feet in length, definitively carnivore, six eyes and two tails. What the hell is that thing? Was all I could think of upon seeing that beast, and its snout bloody with someone's arm still hanging in its mouth. Another lightning struck and we could see for a moment that it tore its way through the metal frames and fence. So the moment the light posts were off, it wasn't just a flicker. It was a full power outage and thus it could get through the electric fence without problems. We had to escape, we had knives but it probably wouldn't do anything to it, but there was no way we could escape given it was still around. Then, it saw us. We had no option but to run inside the prohibited area as it took some time to turn. We ran as fast as we could and not even seeing where we were headed to, we just wanted to escape. I faintly kept hearing its roars as it rushed through the foliage hunting us. Eventually we almost got to hide, almost, except for Mark, who tripped and we couldn't save him, we only kept running as it got hold of him and his screams echoed in our minds as we tried to hide in the foliage. We hid inside some large bushes, hoping it would not see us. After waiting for what felt like an eternity, we decided to get I and make our way to the car. As we were about to turn it on, we heard cackling sounds, and when we looked back, it was staring at us from outside. The moment we sped up it gave chase, somehow keeping up with the car, then it slammed itself into the car, causing us to spin over and crash it to the side of the road. Now we're in the worst situation, face to face with it, I don't even know what we could do other than hold my knife and pray it would go away. Then a small tremor was felt and it looked to the side and a bigger one similar to it showed up, leading it away. The horror struck us upon realizing the horrible truth. It was a juveline. And it wasn't an individual, but a species. I don't really know how to start this. I was watching a YouTube video that made me think I should probably share my experience. This happened during my sophomore or junior year of high school so almost three years ago. I live in rural western North Carolina, and I'm the first stop for the bus route. However, my bus stop is probably a quarter mile away from my house, as our neighborhood is on a hill with a big private drive that leads up to the houses. Every morning, around 6.50, I would walk out of my driveway and down to the bus stop and wait, it's pitch black down there, by the way, with only my phone flashlight to guide me. Every day, I would stand and wait, most of the time listening to music or just looking at my phone. It always felt eerie being in the dark alone like that, but I've always felt uncomfortable in the dark. One morning, as I was walking down the hill, it's a steep, long hill, by the way, I only made it about a quarter of the way down when I heard a scraping noise, almost like nails on sheet metal. Originally, I didn't think much of it and just slowed down a little. Then it happened again, all of this happened within 30 seconds, mind you, 
and by instinct, I stopped in my tracks. My heart started pounding from the noise, making me nervous, and I began to hear loud rustling at the tree line on my left side. Before I knew it, something pale, white, human-shaped, and maybe deer-sized ran out of the wood line into the small yard next to me. I turned and ran so fast I didn't get to look for long, as it triggered my fight-or-flight response. I ran all the way back up the hill, jumped over every step on my porch, and went straight into my house, truly fearing for my life and hyperventilating. Mind you, I'm a large guy, about 5 foot 11, 250 pounds. I don't get spooked easily, but I remember running and letting out a reflexive wail of fear. It's all I could do as I ran, and to this day, I never walk in my neighborhood in the dark. I was scared so badly that I found another way to get to school besides the bus and shortly after got my license. I just want to hear what you all think. I've only told my mom and my friends, and I'm more than willing to post pictures of where it happened as I still live here. I don't know what it is. I've lived in the same house for the last 18 years and it's only gotten worse. I live in an old coal mining town in Pennsylvania. I know my house is haunted, but I believe that to be beside the point. Something is stalking my family. The first encounter I had was in the early 2010s. I heard my name being called repeatedly from far away and it sounded like my friend. Started walking towards home and turned because I felt I was being watched. I saw a dark, humanoid figure that was at least 7 to 8 feet tall. I ran home. Things were fairly quiet as far as I can remember up until the last few years. Recently, things have been amping up. It started as rustling in the woods and the feeling of being watched. Next came the deer. So. Many. Deer. There was one I recall seeing multiple times in the same spot for a few days on my way home that just didn't look right. The most recent encounters has left me researching what to do. Two nights ago my mom saw a pale white face with glowing eyes pressed up against the front door. She said she froze in fear and didn't know what to do. Tonight I got home after dark and walked toward my house. Seconds after I locked my car I heard a blood-curdling scream come from the train tracks followed by a very calm voice yelling help me very loudly. I froze in fear for a solid 15 seconds just listening. I slowly walked up my porch steps just listening to two different voices screaming, one frantic and screeching while the other was calm and just called out help me. I yelled in the front door for my mom because the frantic voice sounded vaguely like my youngest sister, but I thought maybe she was messing around. When she came outside it grew quiet and the frantic voice had stopped. We heard help me one or two more times faintly than nothing. My sister was at a friend's house and it wasn't her. We went to pick up dinner and there were deer everywhere. Now, this isn't uncommon for PA to see a ton of deer, but like I said before, these ones were weird. They stared right at you and didn't run from the car, even if they were in the middle of the road. Someone please tell me WTF is going on. What are these things? I live in the Klamath Mountains in eastern Oregon, about 20 miles from the California border. Growing up I spent a lot of time outside camping hunting fishing etc. A few months ago I had a strange experience on a family trip to our cabin near Crater Lake and wanted to see if anyone could help me maybe find more info on what I saw. I was by myself bird watching at a small pond in the woods maybe half a mile from the cabin in the late afternoon. I was sitting on a big log with binoculars. I wasn't in a blind or anything but I picked a spot where I thought I'd be less visible to any animals. After about an hour I hadn't seen much except a few common ducks and it didn't seem like many animals were very active so I was thinking about leaving. This was about an hour before sunset. Then I saw something move in the trees across the pond, probably a hundred feet away. It was just a flash between trees and I didn't really get any kind of look at it. But I kept watching the spot and after maybe 5 minutes saw something dart from one tree to another. It was bigger than most any local bird except maybe a heron and moved very fast, 
without making any noise, but I still didn't really know what I was looking at. This happened again a few minutes later, and then again a few minutes after that. Each time it was moving closer and closer to the pond. I don't think it knew I was there but it was staying incredibly well hidden, and only revealed itself for a split second at a time. At this point I'm thinking maybe it's a kit fox or a pine marten because of how fast and silently it moved. But I still hadn't got a good look at any part of it in detail. It moved between trees a few more times until it was behind a big dead tree right on the shore. I was staying as still and silent as possible but still worried it would see or more likely smell me and spook. But after a few more minutes I saw something move at the edge of the water. A little arm and hand that looked just like a human's reached out and touched the mud, and then the head and the other arm came into view as it leaned out to drink from the water. I could only see the head and shoulders and arms from where I was, but they looked so much like a person's. Except it was too small, and covered in what I took as grayish brown fur. The face wasn't exactly human, more monkey-like, but it was too far away to see much detail. I decided to try lifting my binoculars to get a closer look, but as soon as I moved it looked up and then disappeared back behind the tree again. I watched until it started to get dark, but I didn't see it again, not even darting behind the trees. I went back to the cabin and told my grandpa what I saw. He's been a rancher in this area his whole life. He said sounds like you ran into a hide behind and laughed. I said no grandpa seriously, this isn't a joke. He said he'd heard stories about Bigfoot and hide behinds and several times saw little human footprints on hunting trips deep in the mountains where no children would be. I think he believed me but he didn't really know anything. I asked my dad and brothers but they just started giving me shit about squatching lol. I went back to the pond the next day and walked around to where the creature had been, but I didn't find any tracks or scat or fur or anything. I did figure it had to be probably about three and a half or four feet tall based on the trees I'd seen it near, but narrow enough to hide completely behind a ponderosa pine. Which makes me think it must have been standing and moving upright. And that's it. I wish I'd seen more of it, but that face and hands were absolutely not like any local animal. It looked very much like a monkey or furry little human. I've tried to find more info but the only cryptid people seriously talk about in this area is Bigfoot. The hide behind seems like a joke. There may be little people or humanoids in some of the local Native Americans folklore but not a lot of detail I could find. I hope someone here has some ideas what I might have seen. It was a very unique and memorable experience and any further information would be appreciated very much. My step-grandfather had a very hard life. He grew up with his many many sibling being passed around through homes and orphanages. He would usually tell me a lot of funny stories because I was still young before he passed. But one story was different and I didn't remember it until just now, when I found out that this sub existed. I have no proof other than my word. One night, when he was 10 or so, he'd gone to bed at one of the orphanages he once stayed at. It was really late at night and he was having a hard time sleeping. But when he did fall asleep he had weird dreams where he made it sound like he was having an out of body experience. He was seeing himself sleeping in his bed that night like he was in the body of another person entirely. He described it like he was standing over himself, so I have to assume he was much taller. Then it all ends because he wakes up and opens his eyes. He said standing over him surrounding his bed, only the back end was touching the wall, were five or so really tall dark people. Dark as in shadowy. He couldn't see their faces at all. He said he didn't feel scared, and that he closed his eyes again. Then he said he fell asleep again and woke up in the morning. That was how he ended the story. No payoff. He never told the story to me again and he's been dead for a long time so there's no way to find out anything else. Based on vague memories of how he ended up telling me the story, I believe he was trying to say they were aliens. As a kid I remember saying that's awful at the end, because I think at the time I thought he was implying they had hurt him in a bad way. But looking back I don't think he meant it as a scary story. 
He was very quiet after. My step-grandfather was great. He was a father figure for me and I think I just wanted to share his story to honor him. I miss him a lot, and I do want to take his word for it here. I don't remember him as a liar, especially when communicating with me. When I was young, I lived in the sticks in Vardaman, Mississippi. We had a cow pasture, and I would always go out there to play with my sister or cousins. However, when I was out there with only my dog, I felt as if I was being watched by someone, or something. I thought there was something out there, so I named it Thing. The grass out there was about 5 feet high, making it really hard to see anything, and I would hear the occasional whisper of Thing. The presence didn't seem threatening, it felt calm and collected, like it just wanted to watch me. Once, I caught a faint glimpse of it before it ducked down to avoid being seen. I would say it was about 6 feet tall, hairy, and resembled Bigfoot in a way. After a while, I moved away and never really thought about it again. But I think it is still back there. It was December 24, 1987. My family went to visit my great aunt in Wilmington, Delaware as we often did, for Christmas. Her husband had died in the house some 20 years earlier. After dinner my brother and I went to sleep in one of the upstairs bedrooms. I went to sleep on the left side of the bed which was closest to the door. My great aunt has a thing where she hated her doors to be shut and absolutely not to be locked so it was wide open as we drifted off. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sounds of something on the roof. I was seven and had just about given up my belief in Santa but it really sounded like footsteps. Could it be him? I tried to wake up my brother but to no avail. Shortly thereafter I turned to my left to see a figure just outside of the doorway. It was human shaped with its arms stretched towards the frame. It was completely black. I know someone was there because it was darker than the surrounding shadows cast in the hall. The only person in the house that was that large was my father. Supposing it was him I said dad? No response. At this this point I was starting to get scared and focused on its head to see its face. The only feature I could make out were two red points of light where the eyes should have been. It was then that I realized that I had messed up by speaking aloud and letting it know I was awake. I have rarely before or since felt such dread. I reached to my right to try and wake up my older brother. Again, no dice. I was alone with this thing three feet away from me. The only thing I could think to do was to pull the blanket over my head, pretend that I was sleeping, and hope to God that it hadn't heard me. Several minutes later I peered under the blankets and it was gone. About five years later I was riding to school with my brother and mom and I worked up enough nerve to tell them about it. I knew it could have been my imagination so I told them with an air of levity. When I was done they were silent for about two minutes. When I asked my mom what was wrong she turned towards me in the back seat and said we've seen him, too. When I was a kid, probably in first or maybe second grade, I was sitting on the couch in our old trailer with my backpack on. It was a double wide, so I could easily look across through the wall opening to the dining room from the couch in the living room. This wasn't far away at all, given the small space. As I sat there, waiting for my mom to finish drying her hair, she had huge, fluffy hair because it was the 90s, lol, I looked up and directly in front of me, standing, or floating? Behind the dining room table, was this solid black figure. I looked at him, and he turned to look at me. We made eye contact, or at least something resembling it because his eyes were like two burning red holes. When our eyes met, time felt like it stopped, and I experienced the most complete terror I have ever felt, even to this day. Frankly, I've been through a statistically improbable number of really terrifying things, but nothing compares to that feeling. I was completely frozen, absolutely terrified. After what felt like an eternity within a moment, he turned and kind of floated out the end of the trailer. As soon as it ended and he was gone, 
I immediately jumped up and ran screaming to my mother. I told her what just happened, and she assured me that it was okay, that it was just my grandpa. I insisted to her that he absolutely was not my grandpa. We're from Appalachia, so ghosts and things like that are well accepted as real, although it is also understood that sometimes people make things up for the sake of a tall tale. Yes, ghosts are real, but one has to approach them with an attitude of discernment. Anyway, I still can't make sense of it at all. About a decade ago, in my early 20s, I found a story online about shadow men, with hats? And that really shook me up because it was the first time I encountered somebody talking about something similar to what I experienced. However, I haven't ever seen any accounts of this specific figure. The sheer terror I felt, completely consumed by fear, gives me an indication that whatever this thing was, it was not kind or good. Does anyone have any similar experiences? Back in 2021, a friend and I were splitting rent on a tiny farmhouse in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico while working. Anytime she was away from her room or out of the house, her door was open. One night, I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up hearing her call me from outside, saying that she needed help. She sounded absolutely terrified. I started to jump up and run to the back door, but something in my brain said to look at her door. It was firmly closed. I noped right to my bedroom, a grown-ass woman, and climbed into my bed, putting my covers over my head. The next morning, she said she had been in her room all night and had never heard a thing. I can't testify to the existence or non-existence of skinwalkers, but New Mexico made me believe in them. I never went outside late at night by myself again while we were there. Okay, so this happened earlier this year. My partner and I were coming back from delivering papers, which we always do late at night as we both work during the day. It was about 10 PM when we were walking back and saw a little girl who looked about nine walking down the street. I thought it was weird. Why would someone let their young kid walk around so late? I said to my partner that we should go see if she needed help. But then suddenly it was no longer a little girl. It was a grown man. The little girl transformed into a man right in front of us. We decided to stay back behind him a bit until he was out of sight. That was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in my life. I had never experienced seeing shadow people until a few weeks ago. I woke up to see one walking into my bedroom closet before dissolving into the background. I've always been skeptical of the supernatural. I have a BS degree and follow a scientific way of thinking. I knew I had just woken up when I saw them, so I figured I was just hallucinating. Now, last night, I woke up and jumped up in my bed because I saw another one crossing the room to go into my closet. The difference this time is that my jumping up woke my cat next to me, who I saw tracking the movement of the shadow person. Am I in danger? Am I being haunted? I've been freaking out a little bit about this. About two months ago, my husband, 34 male, and I, 29 female, were staying in a camper on a friend's property in northern Wisconsin. One night, I wasn't feeling very well, so I went and laid down in the camper and promptly fell asleep. A few hours later, Around 3 a.m., I suddenly woke up and bolted out the door, starting to projectile vomit outside by the window. My husband called out and asked if I was okay. I managed to say, yeah, in between rounds. When I finally finished and felt like I was okay to go back and lay down, I spit a few more times to get rid of the taste, and as I looked up, there was a face about three feet in front of me in the darkness. I stared at it, and it at me. I was petrified, unable to move, but also afraid to take my eyes off of it. I slowly started to move my head up, down, and side to side to try and get a better angle or a closer look, and as I did so, it began to mimic my movements. There we were in the darkness of the forest, 
bobbing up, down, back, forth, slowly leaning closer and closer to one another as we tried to figure each other out. I stared straight into its cold, hollow eyes, unable to look away in fear of what would happen if I did. It stared back at me, almost as if it didn't know what I was either. It was too dark to make out any features, but the face had the shape of a human face. From what I could see on the body from behind the truck, it looked hunched over and distorted. We stayed that way for what felt like forever until I finally managed to call out, Babe. Yeah, my husband responded. There is something out here, I said, only slightly raising my voice. What? He asked. I don't know. Some kind of animal? I'm not sure, but I'm afraid to move. It's just watching me, I whispered almost to myself. He opened the door of the camper and looked out into the darkness. Where? He asked, unable to see what I was seeing. It's right in front of me, just watching, I told him, bewildered that he couldn't see it. He grabbed a flashlight and shined it in front of me, and it was gone. There was nothing there. I never saw it leave. I kept its cold, dead gaze the whole time. How could it not be there? I am still very confused by this interaction. I know it was there. I saw it. It wasn't a dream. And I know I wasn't hallucinating. Can anybody tell me what they think it was? Edit, just to respond to a few comments. I don't drink, and I don't do drugs, so I was not inebriated. I don't remember all the details because I couldn't see very well, but here's what I got. I couldn't tell how tall it was because from what I could see, it looked hunched over and disfigured. I don't think it had any fur, it was pale in color, but again, it was dark, so I'm not sure what color it was. It had big black, soulless eyes, like looking straight into a void. It had sharp jagged teeth, and I don't remember a nose at all. I hope this description helps. Maybe it wasn't a skinwalker because I guess they don't leave Navajo land, but it was really scary. I should also mention that where I was in the woods of Wisconsin was not too far from the Hannibal Indian Reservation in Menominee County, Michigan, but again, not Navajo, so I'm not sure what it was. I'd like to preface this with the fact that I have no idea exactly who or what it was that I saw, but it's pretty spooky regardless of whether or not it has an earthly explanation and that's the part that continues to haunt me, 10 plus years later. I grew up in Sleepy Hollow, New York, home of the Headless Horseman, and allegedly a number of other hauntings. I was 16 at the time and riding shotgun in my then boyfriend's car, Headed home on old Sleepy Hollow Road at 3 a.m., this was before my parents enforced a curfew because I was taking advantage. At the end of old Sleepy Hollow Road is Sleepy Hollow Road, and a stop sign, at which making a left brings you through a densely wooded area to my parents' house. Old Sleepy Hollow Road is dark and curvy, and cuts through the woods that contain the old carriage trails which connect to the cemetery where the headless horseman is laid to rest and said to ride, as well as where some of the other legends of Sleepy Hollow originated. Not many cars frequent this road. Outside of tourist season, the village is quiet and the houses back there are quite sparse. This was the case even more so about 10 years ago. There weren't, and still aren't, many lights on these back roads, but there is one right next to the stop sign, almost like a spotlight. When we pulled up to the stop sign, I got such a fright because a young woman wearing nothing but a long white nightgown or otherwise thin white dress was very suddenly standing on the road right next to the stop sign. At first I was scared that we were going to hit her, but when we drove away the reality of the situation really started to sink in and that's when I felt extremely unsettled. What was she doing there at 3 am? It gave me a heavy pit in my stomach. This was around November in New York, it was quite frigid, and she had no jacket or any shoes on. There are houses back there, but not many. She didn't look directly at us at all, despite us almost hitting her, it almost seemed like she was staring straight through or beyond us. She was unblinking and unmoving. Very pale, with the cliché long dark hair to match. I remember asking my boyfriend if he just saw what I saw, and he just nodded. 
We never spoke about it again, until many years later when I confirmed with him that it really happened and wasn't just a figment or a dream or something. My parents live up against those woods, with my room on the bottom floor. I don't think I slept in my own room for months after that incident. I still think of it when I visit. I've read a lot about this figure and different accounts of it. There are stories of ladies in white across many cultures, but one thing that many of the tales have in common is the betrayal of a lover. This boyfriend was my first love, and unbeknownst to me at the time, he was secretly banging my best friend behind my back. To this day it remains one of the worst betrayals of my life. Eventually he became very violent towards me. I can't help but wonder if she was a warning of some sort? Of course, there are other related ghost stories in the immediate vicinity of where this occurred. Like the woman who froze to death at Raven Rock where she sought refuge during a harsh winter storm, a colonial woman who died hiding from a violent suitor, a Native American girl who was killed at the hands of her jealous lover, a teenager who died after being pushed out of her boyfriend's car during an argument. Hulda of Bohemia's homestead was in those woods, a quick 15-minute walk from my parents' house. I doubt it was her, by the way, but she has a very sad and incredible story associated with her for those who are interested, my fave Sleepy Hollow figure. Truthfully, the list of the many supposed apparitions of the area could go on for far longer. The happy ending I guess is that I dumped that loser and I grew up to work in the morgue. I definitely don't scare easily, and while I've had a few other unusual experiences throughout my life, this one is truly a mystery to me. I think of it every time I drive past that stop sign, and I sometimes still have dreams about it, as was the case last night, so I've resolved to get it all out and writing in an attempt to unload it to some internet strangers. Feel free to share your opinion or theories or similar stories, skeptic or not. For context, I am highly skeptical, but no stranger to the paranormal. I'm the type that believe demons exist, but most ghost stories are overreactions of easily explained phenomena or simply hoaxes. About three months ago I started working security for a hotel that was built back in the 1920s by a major hotel chain that has changed hands multiple times and is now owned by one of the biggest hotel chains. I'm not saying which so the company can't sue me. Now from what I've been told paranormal activity is not a common occurrence in the hotel, but some years back the Make-A-Wish Foundation started sending some children here because well it's a major resort at one of the most popular beaches on the east coast why wouldn't they? However the hotel was not informed of this and didn't realize what was happening until several children died in their rooms over the course of a few weeks. Supposedly on quiet nights you can hear children playing with a ball in the North Tower ballrooms at night. For years guests complained of children playing ball loudly next to their rooms even and when security would check there would be no one there. This has not happened in a while, but going into this story you should understand that my opinion on the cause of what I've seen may be warped by being told this story. Now every shift we do a floor check, especially on night shift when I work. At first I never noticed anything strange, I got a little creeped out by the quiet of the floors at night but nothing supernatural. The hotel has two separate towers separated by a restaurant and shopping area that connects them. About a month into the job and suddenly I started feeling like something was following me on my floor checks especially in the ST which is the biggest and tallest and where I understand most jumpers choose because all the rooms facing the ocean have sliding glass doors with a short railing in front and you can put the rest together from there. Anyway it got really bad in October, maybe the spooky season had an effect on me, but this feeling of being watched and followed never went away. As the weeks have gone on, I started seeing distorted faces in windows as I passed by to the point I no longer look at them. The floor pattern sometimes reflects on the glass and the mind could easily make a face with the pattern, but some of these faces were up further on the glass where this wouldn't have been possible. When I focus up there sometimes I can almost hear whispers in the back of my mind, urging me to unalive myself or lambasting me for the mistakes I've made or even telling me insecurities I have about myself I've never told anyone about. 
In the last few weeks some strange physical and auditory phenomena have occurred. Part of what we do on floor checks is close doors we find open, and some of the doors lately have been more difficult to close, one in particular I had to use all my strength to slam shut. The ice machines on each floor sometimes make a banging noise while in operation so I usually attribute any noise I hear from the vending area to that, but sometimes it almost has sounded like something was rummaging in the garbage cans and when I'd go to investigate I'd hold my keys so they wouldn't jingle in case it was a person, and as soon as I do the rummaging noise will stop. On a couple of occasions I've felt what I can only describe as hands touching me while closing certain doors sometimes just a tickle and other times a brush against the back of my hand and even a feeling like someone on the other side of the door is pulling it in the opposite direction against me. I now dread the floor checks especially after 3 am I'm not trying to make this seem scarier than it is, but these things intensify the closer it gets to that hour. Whatever they are they aren't friendly and I think they know I can sense them. They really don't like that I can sense them, like some nights that watched and followed feeling is more like a burning hatred directed towards my existence, like being stalked by an enemy or a predator. I'm pretty religious, and whenever. These things happen I always pray to God and when I do it usually goes away whatever it is. The scariest thing though is the last time it was that intense I heard something growl next to my ear. I've never been hurt by them so my assumption is they can't hurt anyone physically, but they try to communicate often and want their presence acknowledged. Almost as though that's where their power comes from. My grandmother told me once that demons truly have no power, they are only capable of whatever we believe them to be capable of. My mounting fear is feeding them whatever they are. My experiences could be just m seeing things or looking too much into something completely explainable I don't know this is just what I've seen and heard. Whatever it is hunting me at night my co-workers don't know about it, or at least they aren't telling anyone. I am bipolar, but medicated and I've never had hallucinations. Maybe I'm just crazy and seeing things, but if that's the case why am I not having any other signs of a manic episode or psychosis and why am I only seeing things in that one part of the building? Hi everyone. I wanted to share my experience with a fairy when I was a child. I'm currently 19, and all my life I've been obsessed with fairies. As a kid, I read books about them, research them, and left offerings out to them in my backyard. And one time I saw one with no doubt. I was about 9 to 10 years old and I was at my cottage. This cottage is about 3 hours north of Toronto. The cottage has a huge forest in its backyard, and I was alone waiting at the top of the stairs leading into the forest. Suddenly, a tiny creature flew up to my face. I can't fully picture it, but I know it was mainly brown with long limbs and wings. It had a human-like face, and it made a motion with its hand saying come here or follow me and then it flew off towards the front of my cottage. I've had other smaller supernatural experiences at this cottage, but this one changed my life. Or solidified my belief in fairies, and even now, almost 10 years later I still doubt it. Let me know if you guys have any other similar experiences, and thank you for reading. I feel like something was trying to warn me. When I woke up, there was red writing all over the ceiling. It looked like computer programming code, but amongst this, there were glowing words in English. However, my brain almost couldn't register what it was saying, but all I felt was dread. I looked to the left of me and saw the entrance to this bridge that is in my city. It also felt like there were a few people standing around watching me, but I couldn't see them. After about 15 seconds or so, all of this disappeared. I knew I was awake the whole time. It wasn't just some weird dream, it at least felt extremely real. The reason I feel like it's a warning is because of two things. Recently, I connected with someone from a city that is on the other side of this bridge, whom I am due to meet. And later on next month, my cousin is getting married, also over the bridge. All morning, I have been trying to work out if it is just some paranoid hallucination or whether I should take this seriously. When I checked the time after, 
It was exactly 2 a.m., exactly one hour after I fell asleep at 1 a.m. I found it strange how it was exactly an hour after. I managed to get back to sleep after an hour or so, but I feel like I've got my guard up. I googled the entrance to the bridge, and it is exactly the same as what I saw. I've never been a spiritual person or anything like that, but this felt so real. I've never experienced anything remotely like this. So this happened years ago in about 2019. I was over at a friend's house. We had a good amount of people to play with their Ouija board, maybe five or so people. I want to preface this by mentioning the board we were using was used before to summon the well-known Ouija demon known as Zozo, by the person who owned the board. They supposedly sold their soul to Zozo for the demon to protect them from their biggest fear, which was being in a car crash or something similar to do with cars in that way. Anyways, we started playing. We circled the board with a planchette to warm the board up, and began asking questions. It began to answer, responding yes to if there was a spirit with us, and answering basic questions such as its name, how old it was and why it died, which it gave answers to, I believe the first spirit had answered hospital. The group I was playing with began to ask dumb and all too playful questions and not taking it seriously, even making fun of me when I chastised them for not being serious about it, so I stopped playing with them after a while. I remember their non-serious nature went on for a while, but as they continued to ask questions, they all had gone silent and had seemed to become entranced by the board, deeply focusing and having a very very long session with it. I had tuned out mostly at this point, hanging out with my other friend on the couch who had also not opted into the session. This wasn't that I wasn't interested in playing, I just had no tolerance for the group not taking the game seriously, as I've always experienced paranormal shit since I was a baby in every single one of my households I had lived in prior, and was really sensitive to the paranormal. This was my first experience with the board, before I was followed by something. I asked to borrow the Ouija board, and my friend gave me permission. This marks the next time I played the board, which, this is going to be very dumb and cliche, but the day was Friday the 13th, and I decided on playing in Cal Anderson Park in Capitol Hill in Seattle, Washington. My friend and I took the board to the park, and I managed to find a few strangers to play with, my next mistake. We sat down and circled the board, I took to asking the questions. The spirit I managed to contact began to give me random letters, as opposed to the previous session having clear English written out. I asked if this was Latin, as I knew if the board began speaking Latin, you're supposed to end the session. It answered yes, then I asked if it was a negative spirit, it answered yes. Then I, my next mistake, asked IT permission if I could end the session. It told me no then began to circle the board in wide circles. I got really uncomfortable, and tried to push the planchette to goodbye, and a strong force pushed against the planchette, not allowing me to pull it to goodbye. I did manage to push it to goodbye after some more force, and told the spirit it was not allowed to contact me again. I cut contact with the session, and flipped the board, believing the session was cut off, but left with a deep feeling of dread in my stomach like something wasn't right. And that feeling was correct. My ex and I kept the board at his house in his shed for some time after that, because when we kept it in his house, strange things would happen such as footsteps, doors closing and opening, knocks underneath the floor, his doorknob wiggling, and other happenings. We returned the board to the original owner after this, the one who had summoned Zozo with it, we didn't want it around anymore and the owner had wanted it back. After all of this, a spirit followed me home. I would hear footsteps running up and down my stairs outside of my bedroom. I would wake up freezing cold with a deep feeling of dread and a figure at the foot of my bed. One night there was heavy banging noises in the garage, which my parents blamed on me, to which I frantically responded see. Something isn't right, something did follow me home from the Ouija board, they began believing me more that night after the banging. I was so scared during this time that I sprinkled salt around my entire bed and doorframe, smudged with white sage, 
before I knew it was closed practice, slept with crosses and a Bible on my bedside table and prayed to God every night. I became extremely spiritual around this time because I honestly had no idea what else to do or where to turn. I just wanted the haunting to stop. One morning, my ex and I heard my mom knock on my bedroom door and ask us why are you guys sleeping still? And he got aggravated at my mom waking us up so early, I checked the time and it was 7 am, which is really unlike my mom to be wondering why we were still sleeping at that time. When I went upstairs, a bit annoyed, to ask her about it, she was on FaceTime with my sister's kids in the living room, and had no idea what I was talking about, my mom isn't the type to prank me like that or lie, and she was really busy with the FaceTime call at the time it happened. I honestly think back and wonder if whatever asked us why we were sleeping was mimicking my mom or was an entirely different woman's voice and we had just chalked it up to being my mom since that's the only lady in the house. The thought still makes me sick honestly. The person who owned the board who summoned demons with it was also extremely troubled, and ended up unaliving himself a year or two after I stopped being friends with them. I haven't touched a Ouija board since, and the experience left me with some trauma. I still sleep with the lights on. I still did continue use with my pendulums, tarot cards, practiced with gems, and scrying. But I never touched a board again, and I never will. The concept interests me still, and the fact I did have such a profound experience I'm not sure if I'm morbidly lucky to have had, I'm just glad that thing that had followed me home stopped contact after some time. I recently came across your video from years ago about the invisible manta ray. I have had a similar experience in the past, but instead of being outside, it was inside my house. I saw it floating in a high corner, almost like a living creature. It seemed to be analyzing me, which really freaked me out. I tried not to look at it, hoping it would disappear, and eventually, it did. I've considered various explanations for what I saw such as a creature that lives in the air, similar to those in the sea. I've even thought it could be a UFO or an angel. It was such a bizarre experience that I never bothered to look it up, but stumbling upon your posts has brought back those feelings of fear and fascination. I just wanted to share this with you. I just want to share a couple of my own fairy encounters that I 100% believe to be true and not my imagination. I'd love to hear if anyone has any other similar stories. In the first grade, I slept over at my friend's house. We had engaged in a lot of fairy hunting activities, more like trying to summon them. We made fairy houses, watched Tinker Bell, chanted, anything you could imagine. So. I wake up and check my surroundings to see if anything had changed since I had gone to bed. In my peripheral vision, I see a little figure more or less hovering above the ground, smaller than a finger. It was black and had wings. My shoe, with laces, was sitting on the ground, and the bedroom door was open. The figure flew out the door, but on its way out, it grabbed my shoelace and pulled my shoe onto its side and closer to the door. Unfortunately, my friend did not see it, and she still does not believe me because her sister had been the one responding to our fairy letters the whole time. But it would have been impossible for her sister to have done it. The second time I saw one, around fifth grade, it was a very similar experience. I was outside in the carport when, once again, I saw something in my peripheral vision, a small black figure hovering above the ground, flying very fast. I saw it go into some short shrubs, it was not windy, and I heard and saw it push the leaves out of its way. My sister was there, but once again, did not see it. Lastly, in high school, I dove back into fairies. I researched them and did all the things to try and interact with them again. I was outside during twilight with my friend, literally talking about them when we heard the most magical, peculiar sound, which, to us, sounded like it was coming from an old tree stump. Imagine if Maybell flowers, lily of the valley, could ring, and there were one thousands of them. That is what we heard, a soft and higher pitched sound. We both heard it. 
We went to investigate where it was coming from, and there were no birds or bugs that we could see. Neither of us had heard a sound like it before, nor have we heard one since. Honestly, hearing this sound is even more convincing than actually seeing them the times before. My brother and dad told me this story of their experience after they had gotten back from one of their snowmobiling trips. We live in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm not sure which mountain they went up to for their snowmobiling this night. They were riding their snowmobiles down a road with fresh snow, and it hadn't snowed for a couple of hours. As they were riding, they ended up encountering what appeared to be a perfectly built, brightly lit campfire, right in the middle of the road, in the middle of the dark. There were no footprints leading out on any side of the fire, no car tracks, and no sign of any human, just a picture-perfect campfire. There wasn't any way snow could have covered any signs of people being around, as I mentioned before, it hadn't snowed for a while. They didn't stick around to find out, though, as they were thoroughly creeped out and quickly continued on their way. I think about it frequently, they had no explanation for where the campfire had to have come from. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.